I got this purest thing about jazz. It's like, I don't consider myself a jazz player. You know, I'm not right. John, Schof I'm not John Schofield, you know I mean? Like I, I hold him in like way above myself. Like I'm, I'm just a guy. I'm, that's why I have my little jazz wannabes group. Like I want to be, you know, when I grow up, I want to be an, or actually I want to be an orchestra composer, but when I grow up, but I, uh, you know, I, it's, it's, a, there, there's something about that level of, of musicianship, you know, when you, what, you know, John Schofield, like him playing a solo, him navigating chord changes, but it's, it's spontaneous composition is the highest form of art. As far as I'm concerned, these guys are Pat Metheny. I mean, I don't love everything he does, you know, and his sound sometimes is, or Stern, like it's, it's like, can you back the fucking chorus and reverb off a little bit please and get it a little more dry in my west you can hear some distortion well, they probably feel the same way if they hear help but can you can you can you can you wet it up a little bit more? exactly exactly right, exactly right. see so i want to hear it like i want to like what you hear west and jim hall and they don't have it all bathed in you know mm -hmm. in that sound but but fucking a can those guys improvise yeah. holy yeah. shit man Yes, I do. And I'm recording now, just so you know. Already. Yeah, no problem. That's cool. Okay, so you are currently not in, not overseas. You're in LA currently? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm home. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to open the windows real quick. Sorry, it's kind of warm. No, no. The, 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 actually, the more informal, the better. Cool, cool. I closed mine because my neighbor decided to start mowing his lawn, <laughs> right? Oh, is that... I, I love that. My favorite are those blow, those leaf and grass blow uh, blowers. You know, that's always, it's always, always when I'm recording something, you know, like with a microphone, like a guitar part or a vocal part or something. And then it's like, and you're like, oh, come on, man. Like, really? Yeah. I've actually started using those in my music or the sound of cars. Yeah. <laughs> by or like layering leaf blowers. I have a track where I like layer four leaf blowers <laughs> at the that, same time. That, 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 that's hilarious. We did on the aftertaste record back in, uh, we were kind of 97. We were, yeah. Yeah. We were here in LA at Hollywood sound and, uh, with Sardi and I was doing some guitar stuff and we were getting the uh, radio station coming in loud and clear. So we just, that's the end of the album that, uh, uh Christ is King outro that kind of goes destructo. I was just like, turn it up. So we cranked it. It's like, it's pretty hilarious. You can hear like, so, you know, all these weird, just, you know, through the guitar pickups, it was, you could, I think we mic'd the pickups or something. I can't remember, but yeah, fun. Right. There's also that part on Street Crab where there's a radio broadcast with a, a news update about Somalia. It, yeah. Wow. God, I forgot about that. That's, that was a long time ago. Nine, God, man, that was 90. I think we recorded in 93, 94, something like that. That's, right. Yeah. That was, uh, that was at River Sound up in, um, up on the Upper East Side, Donald Fagan um, and um, Mike, I believe Mike Nichols was the Steely Dan producer, right? And they are Gary Katz, one or the other. They that was their studio together. They had that uh, that beautiful Neve from Motown, that Neve eighty seventy eight, one of the three uh, Motown Neves. I think Madonna has one. They have one, and I forget who has the other other one because Barry Gordy passed away, so uh, I can't remember. Anyway. Yeah, great console, great studio. I got to meet Donald Fagan. That was awesome. It's really oh, cool, really do cool. tell. Yeah, he was so he was just great. Uh, Phil Burnett, who was the is the house engineer there. He was Bad Brains live engineer. Had some great, great Bad Brains stories. But uh, he said he said Donald's coming in today, and so he uh, and I was like, no way, man. So he was in the office. He brought me in, and and Phil's like, for some reason, this guy likes your music. And, and Fagan's like, oh God, you got terrible taste, you know. And he's just was <laughs> really self-effacing and just witty and funny as you'd expect. So we talked for a while, and I didn't I didn't go into the you know sometimes the thing that fans do to you were like. <laughs> Yeah, I saw you. I met you in 1992 for, you know, outside, you know, and then you didn't remember me three years later. And I was like, God, I'm so sorry, you know, or whatever. <laughs> so, you know, like, I, you know, I wanted to say that thing and Can't Buy a Thrill was one of the first albums I ever bought uh, uh, for myself in, on the Columbia Records Club. Uh, so I was 12 years old when it came out and, and, uh, and uh, you know, obviously already developing a 
taste for strange music, you know, because I just loved uh, Do It Again. I love the hits were on the radio at the time, too. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, he was he was great. Really, really, really cool. I got to see him once um, with uh, my ex-wife, uh, sweetly bought tickets um, and we didn't pull it. I didn't pull any strings. It was when, you know, the band was still pretty big and like I got front row to Bob Dylan and, and um, Van Morrison in New York. And uh, she wanted to surprise me. So she, she got these, we were literally in the second to the last row at that place, that, that uh, awful venue in New Jersey, that stadium out there, I forget what it's called. I think where the Nets used to play. Continental Arena, formerly Brendan Byrne. Brendan Byrne, Byrne. yeah, yeah. It was just, you know, we had terrible seats. And I was laughing. I said, I could have, I could have made some call. And she's like, no, you know, like, <laughs> I was like, this is great. It's great. This is great. And you know, we got to see him. Right. And it she was wanted cool. to feel like she did something for you. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. It was really sweet, actually. We had a great time and and uh, whatever. But it would have been pretty cool to like you know be down front, see, because that was one of my childhood bands. So it was you know, uh, it was great recording in that studio. Man, oh man, Oof, wow, what a what a place. So, hey, welcome to Feedback Def. I'm Sabi RK, the apostate music journalist. Thanks for watching. This is easily one of the most pleasant interviews I've ever done. It is also probably one of the most incoherent. <laughs> right off the bat, literally from word one, this exchange between me and Helmet founder band leader Paige Hamilton got off on a note of just chatting about music. And it stayed that way. I completely chucked my sense of any kind of uh, direction to go in with with my questions out the window right away. I've sat on this interview for quite some time because I had was like stressing over, well, I've got to try to edit this into some flow. Decided not to do that. You're going to get the raw, full, unexpurgated thing. I'll just give you a little bit of background first. I'm going to read to you from a review I wrote in 2016 of the Helmet album that was out at the time called Dead to the World. This is what I wrote. It's hard to calculate just how pervasive Helmet founder Paige Hamilton's influence has been. But at one point during the mid-90s, it seemed as if his footprints were all over the heavy metal and alt-rock landscape. You could make a strong case that there are traces of Hamilton's style in the music of Tool, the Deftones, and even the likes of Weezer and the Smashing Pumpkins. Helmet's reach makes sense given that the band's career arc traversed multiple scenes in a short time. Starting out with one foot in New York's avant-garde sphere following Hamilton's tenures with Glenn Branca and Band of Susans, Helmet's earliest releases on the iconic indie label Amphetamine Reptile in 89-90 landed them in the middle of a burgeoning underground wave that included other cult acts like Cows, Killdozer, Today's the Day, and others. Along the way, Helmet also became associated with the artier side of New York's hardcore and post-hardcore circles, alongside bands like Quicksand and Orange 9mm. Metal audiences and bands, including Sepultura and Pantera, embraced them as well. By 1994, Helmet found themselves in the thick of the alternative rock zeitgeist, as their video for Milk Toast, their contribution to The Crow soundtrack, scored heavy rotation on MTV. And just prior to the band's breakup in the late 90s, Helmet toured with Korn and Limp Bizkit. Hamilton's hypnotic, earworm-like riffs have a way of instantly getting under your skin and sticking to your brain like gum. So does the grooving but strangely counterintuitive approach to rhythm that sets the band's sound apart to this day. So it's easy to see why Helmet's signature style rubbed off so readily on other bands. In fact, it's hard to imagine Meshuggah or the Dillinger Escape Plan evolving the way they did without Helmet's proto-math metal vocabulary to build on. Most of the world first heard of Helmet in 1992 on the release of their biggest album, Meantime. And back then, they were being marketed as this quasi-hardcore, quasi-metal, not quite metal total short hair, almost paramilitary looking band that, that was from the hardcore world, but was more cerebral. They're also coming from the noise scene and had a band leader with a master's in jazz composition. They were being sort of cross-marketed to fans of heavy music, but there was a real twist. I personally thought at the time that their whole look and aesthetic was pretty contrived, but it didn't take long before Hamilton be just became one of like 
one of the most impactful guitar players I've ever heard. And the band's third album, Betty, which was released in 1994, actually the 30th anniversary is coming up, is the album I listened to most obsessively over a specific span of time. I listened to that record, no exaggeration, every day for a year and a half. Day after day after day after day after day. The way I like to describe Helmet is there's this very, very, very cerebral calculated aspect fused with this savagery. And there's also traces of their early noise downtown avant-garde background that remained in the band sound even after they got more sort of metal. If you took a chimpanzee's brain and put it into a robot, it might make music like Helmet. Thanks and apologies to Perry Serpa, who was working uh, publicity for the most recent Helmet album, Left, when Paige and I did this interview. Without further ado, there's so much here. I'll just let Paige take it away. Yeah, well, I mean, you pretty much touched on everything <laughs> I wanted to talk about, which is all jumbled. And I, uh... I know, that's that's the way my brain works. I was thinking <laughs> about that the, the other day. So we were talking, so somebody was saying, my girlfriend was just saying, you, you, you need to take make lists and, and organize because you got like, I'm, I'm, I'm multitask all the time. You know, I'm like writing an orchestra piece for the high school in Memphis. I'm trying to write helmet songs. I'm doing, you know, I'm giving guitar lessons. So I'm doing, you know, writing out homework for students. I'm doing, uh, uh, you know, I'm working, writing a piece for electric guitar and orchestra that I'm going to try to get a commission for. I'm doing, um, oh, I'm re I'm doing these uh, electronic pieces that I've been working on from a movie. I quit, uh, you know, so I'm writing, I'm doing all that stuff. You know, and everybody's like, why don't you do social media? I'm like, because I'm a musician, I yeah. like because I want to play guitar, sing, write music, and perform. That's you know, and I like goofing around with pedals. You know, I do. I, I was doing a movie simultaneously while we were making the Helmet album uh, called uh, Last Breath, uh, and I'm like, did the director get the title from the Helmet song? And he's like, no, <laughs> and I'm like, well. <laughs> He ripped, he ripped me off. So, you know, but uh, it was fun. It was, you know, I love doing all this stuff, but that's how, so I apologize when. Stuff no, 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 no. Actually, that's fine because uh, I had so many questions and didn't, uh, unusually didn't put them in order, which I never go in order anyway. And yeah, they're yeah. all jumbled and uh, my phone good, screen good. is actually further away from my, too far from my eyes so that I can, can't even see the questions anyway, but it'll all. Yeah, yeah. We'll all still. So, I mean, Steely Dan is a, or Donald Fagan, Can't Buy a Thrill. It's all a really good place to start because it's, it is incredible that that stuff was on the radio. I mean, I, I don't know that I can think of another form of popular music where the technique was so dis, not disguised, but made palatable for a mass audience. I mean, I'm sure there is examples, but to me, that's like sort of like the ultimate. It's like, holy shit, like that they were able to take that and present it in a way that it could be on like AM radio and people could sing along. Yeah. Yeah. And that, um, I've been thinking of all the, of all the years you've talked about your origins, you know, listening to Zeppelin, Sabbath, ACDC, yeah. uh, Aerosmith. And then of course, um, discovering, uh, uh, George Benson and Miles Davis, Coltrane, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's all yeah. you've talked about that a million times. Um, I've never really had a clear sense of, even though you've explained what Robert Poss and Glenn Branca and all those influences and Wire and Killing Joke, you've explained all those pieces, but I've never gotten a clear understanding of like where this your um drive towards economy how right. that actually developed because you know from going from um um love agenda to the the seven inches on amrep it makes sense like the the you know the the tone the guitar tones and stuff and what you were doing yeah but from there to strap it on it's like where did this where did this come from because you're big jimmy page fan tony iomi all the people i mentioned and yet everything is really, really stripped down. I know you had a music teacher that drilled you on BB King solos that were really sparse, but I still am having, can you fill that in for, for, yeah, for you know, I, I think I thought about that. I mean, obviously, you know, 34 years into the band, you know, and, and a, a thousand interviews or whatever you, 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 
you don't think about something when you're doing it, you know, and I can, and I can now I've been able to look back and have these little epiphanies or moments where I remember, Oh, I, I was, I'm a music producer because I was car sick and, you know, and, and in America, horse no name came on in the station wagon, you know, with mom and dad and grant and Julie, my brother and sister. And I stopped being car sick. Cause I went, cause I closed my eyes and, and I still, to this day, I hear that song and I have this warm, beautiful, amazing feeling of, you know, going inside the music and you can point to specific things. I think there, there are two things as far as the, you know, minimalism or economy or whatever you want to talk about, you, you know, call it, um, it would be Glenn Branca and wire. Uh, and I, you know, I was studying jazz and I had just got my master's degree. And so I started, you know, answering ads in newspaper in the village voice and auditioning. I mean, for a cover band, uh, for a band called, I'll never forget a band called the children, which was a folky Rocky thing out in, I want to say in Queens, there was another band in Queens that was doing, uh, that were doing covers. There was a band in downtown New York in the East village, uh, doing kind of, and I told them they were too loud, too loud. <laughs> Because you weren't into rock, you weren't. You had sort of drifted away from rock at this point as yeah, a listener. Yeah, I, I, in the seventies, you know, when when we we weren't hearing in through the outdoor on the radio, we were hearing, you know, uh, in in Medford, Oregon, you know, uh, we were hearing uh, Foreigner and Journey and Toto. Uh, not even Toto. I don't even remember Toto at all, but I remember Journey and Foreigner and Sticks and a uh, um, that sound. Uh, Boston was a big band and all my friends love Boston. They were like, I can't believe you don't like Boston. I'm just like, I don't know, man, there's just something I, I really appreciate the musicianship and the production, you know, quality and all these things and the, you know, the hooks and all that stuff, you know, as an older man, but just, it doesn't, it doesn't get, you know, tear sure. my insides out the way like Thelonious Monk does or, um, you know, why wire to me like they when I was talking to Bruce Gilbert one day on tour, Ben Susan's when because we opened for wire and he was he was like, yeah, God, we were just trying to write a song with just one chord. You know, and then I remember reading an Elvis Costello interview uh, uh, on Blood and Chocolate, uh, uh, uncompl uncomplicated. He was like, I'm trying to write a song with one chord, but just couldn't do it. And I, you know, you get to thinking and, and that hypnotic kind of thing that wire had the song Drill that they do. Uh, and it was a brand new album at the time in 1988 when I was in Van Susan's and we were touring with them. Um, and I went back when Robert said, hey, we're gonna to, uh, tour with this band Wire. And I went and bought their, you know, I got Chairs Missing, I got, uh, um, uh, you know, the Pink Flag mm -hmm. and um, 154. Still have these beautiful vinyl copies with the extra seven inch on mm -hmm. 154 and stuff. and. Um, and I just fell in love with it. I just fell, you know, and, and, and getting to know them as people and then getting to play on one of their albums. And um, there, there's something, uh, Casper Brotsman, like meeting, uh, hearing Casper Brotsman for the first time, I was at the World's Fair with Glenn in uh, 1992, doing uh, after the World's Fair uh, gig, we, um, I did a press tour. So I was, it was before Meantime came out. So I was flying to like Amsterdam and Berlin and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Paris and all over the place, Madrid, and doing interviews all day in a hotel room. And I met a met a uh, Spanish girl who spoke German. I spoke German. She had studied there. I had studied there. Invited me out one night with their friends. Met her friend who escaped from East Germany, and he gave me a cassette tape of Casper Rosbach. And you know, and I'm like, this is the thing. The thing that I think so many people miss about. Uh, about these bands or about something like ACDC is, is, the, is the compositional soundness of it. I don't know how else to describe it other than I can hear somebody that's a super musician, super player, but it, it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't take you. There's not, there's not a commitment to that, that theme. Like it's the song Sinatra, Helmet, it's mm -hmm. one riff and then tension, tension. So, you know, uh, quiet, louder, quiet, louder, feedback, you know, and then it, you, you're in that one, you know, E flat to D, you know, thing for the whole song until you get to that bridge. And then there's this that that progression comes out. And I've I've I think when I when I got that first drop tune riff in my head walking home one night for repetition and I heard that, you know, that this this note, an octave, you know, uh, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, you know, I heard I, I guess it was I, I was. Uh, I, I, I 
picked up the guitar and that and I needed to get that. And it wasn't, and so I go, well, if I if I drop this string down, Bruce Gilbert had already talked to me about he was playing a drop tuning, and I was like, I was too lazy. I'm like, I'm not gonna do that. That I I learned the guitar like this. I, I play a six-string guitar, E A D G B. And when I heard that riff in my head, walking home at four in the morning, you know, I, I picked the guitar up and 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 it got me out of all those, you know, habits of of you know trying to write Husker Du songs or ACDC riffs or whatever. You know how we all fall into these habits as guitar players. It's 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 what we do. I mean, it's part of playing the guitar. Ornick Coleman had said a great thing. I listened to him on the radio one day in uh, Eugene, Oregon, before his concert, uh, the night before he was on the college station and invited everybody to come down to soundcheck, which I, of course, did thinking it's going to be packed. And I was the only idiot there. <laughs> and, uh, but I sat a front row seat to watch him conduct, uh, you know, rehearse, uh, uh, soundcheck and rehearsal. Um, and he said, you know, I just got to the point where I'm, I'm, re I'm really good on the saxophone. You know, I can really play the saxophone, but that's not what it's, a, but, but I have to kind of tap into something else to free myself from the technique. And the technique is not the story. It's the music that's the story. And that's what people, so many guitar players, especially because the horn, at least it's in your mouth, it's in your lungs, it's in your, your sinuses, your brain, everything in your body is vibrating. The guitar is out here. It's a separate physical. So to feel it in here, you know, as Mozart said, you know, it's got to be, you know, come from heart, brain and ear, you know, not just fingers and brain. And so many guitar players are just fingers and brain. Like, and I see this, they're unconscious. They're not playing music. They're, they're disconnected. They're playing shit that I do it. I mean, I can sit down and play through a two, five, one, play shit that I've, you know, pl same licks I've played for 40 years, you know, and it's not, you have to, the thing helmet did is it freed me from that it made me listen to, to to what was in my head to write away from the instrument i get a riff in my head then i might pick the guitar up i might write a rhythm down and a lot of the stuff comes that way i write down you know i'm, I'm not writing down pitches i'm just writing down a rhythm pattern and then it's obvious what's going to come you know um i came up with some rhythm exercises for my students because everybody's so you know it's this thing with odd time signatures helmet has as many odd time signatures as anybody but it's in four <laughs> you know acdc has as many odd time signatures as anybody you listen to bad boy boogie that malcolm angus uh you know breakdown where you know malcolm is is grooving in you know the hemiola and three against four and then he goes he plays i think one point he plays it you know one two and then he's going nah, 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 on the one side and right it's just is that the so, part you're talking about? Oh, uh, I, I, it's it, it's you know he I I can't think of it off the top of my head, uh, but that's it's when they it's live it's the live version on if you want blood where it, break, it breaks down and he's and you know I was, I was in my car and I was trying to tap it out one time in a stoplight and uh, and I'm like oh man you know it's like so I kind of just went through it between you know Brand Avenue and 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 uh, Verdugo on my way home. <laughs> in Glendale and, uh, and got, and, you know, and it says like, wow, that's cool. He's playing, you know, I didn't write any, I, I need to write it out and, and write out all the different patterns he's doing in, in, you know, against four. Cause at one point there was a three, I mean, you know, the obvious one, you know, bam, boom, boom, um, you know, bam. you know, one, two, five, two, bam, 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 you know, da, uh, uh, that, that is a really yep. common rhythm, you know, um, but there were, there were other patterns in there. If I remember like, you know, and he's just and malcolm's riffing uh, angus is riffing over the top it's just I, I people miss that i don't know to me that's the that's that's where the music is it's beautiful it, to me it's more interesting and exciting to be able to do that and 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 not uh not be making it you know he's he's not thinking about no. that he's not it's not some pattern he you know he's just grooving and it's just it's so deep to me that's i'll never forget uh when we met the pantera guys in in minneapolis opening they were opening for prong we were opening for melvin's so those two rooms in minneapolis the uh, first avenue was the big one and seventh street entry was a small room so it was two bands in first avenue 
and then us in Seventh Street Entry, then Prong in First Avenue, and then Melvin's. So I had watched Mind Over Four, and uh, and then I watched Pantera, and I was like, holy shit! It's the first time I'd ever seen the Cowboys from Hell. And so we went on next in the small room, and I said something in the mic. I fucking never heard that band before, but holy shit! And I heard this thing, so I looked down, and they're all standing down in front of me, <laughs> and. So they they loved this loved our show. They bought everything, cassette tapes and drumsticks and all this stuff. And and we get to Dallas, and we meet and we they meet up with us at Soundcheck at in the at Trees. And so we're in the parking lot. And they're playing his songs from Vulgar Display that were unfinished. And uh, Dime's like, I told you you're going to influence me. And um, and I loved. I just I I love you know that a, you know a, a more kind of they came from more of a metal place but they got into what we did and then we were playing the song distracted and phil was had his boys down front and they were you know there's a pit going most of the whole show and the song distracted and starts off this is the wrong tuning but it, you i'm know, familiar yeah. with the song but i i love you yeah that that riff so they all stop and i just remember the looks on their faces you know and they stopped for a minute and then their eyes lit up and they got, they were like, Oh my God. Yeah. Boom. There it is. You know, there's the, there's that thing. And, and uh, I just love that. I don't know. I hear it all the time. I'm like, I hear that's the way I hear things when I'm writing. And there's some riffs on this new album that I haven't started to learn yet today. Uh, my thing was I'm going to take July off and, and do jazz things and other fun things and uh, spend time with my girlfriend. And then, Today is August 1st and I'm going to start learning the songs because I, you know, have to do this, this and this together is, you know, and, and you, when you're writing and you're overdubbing and, do, you know, doing vocals and backing vocal parts and, you know, working on stuff with Kyle, uh, you know, drum parts and everything, your, your brain gets into sort of, I don't know, it's all this, it's all big mush right now. Like I can't, you know, so, uh, uh, I had done an interview for Guitar World last week and, and it was uh, mentioning songs and i'm like oh god how's it, how's it go and like so today i'm like i have a list i'm gonna do hit a song every day and, you know re learn learn the learn the riffs and because when we when we record we do drums and and uh and guitar together like and and we did a scratch guitar through some like a fractal or something that jim kaufman had in his studio and then i redo my my guitar and then i Dan comes in and does his, and we send it to Dave, and he does his bass because Dave's uh, still in New York, so um, which is which is complicated, you know. And it's you know it is what it is, and and um, you know I understand people don't like leaving home when you have a lot of touring coming up and whatever. And he was we had just been to Australia, New Zealand. He's like, God, I really don't feel like coming to LA, and you know, I'm like all right, <laughs> but um, you know. You hit, you hit a few few snags, but but it it, it worked. Um, but yeah, I'm excited. I'm I'm looking forward to to. I printed all the lyrics out so I can read, you know, read what I'm saying and and kind of learn the stuff. But yeah, I was going to ask you about the coordination it takes to those riffs and those vocal lines are not easy to do together. And it made me wonder. I mean. The one I pointed to in, in a, when I wrote up Helmet a few years ago was it, it's easy to get bored. I can't even air guitar and sing that song. Yeah. Even air. It's, it's songs like that are easier because it's a, it's just, a, it's a loop, you know, it's a repeated pattern. And so this goes and I turn my brain off, you know, and then I, start, okay. I, I can, I can sing, you know, um, that one, Oh yeah, I play through the whole song, don't I? Yeah, there's there there are some. There's another song. Oh, um, with a, with a, a a similar riff, similar range. Uh, uh, Welcome to Algiers, where I lay out on the verses, but I can play and sing it. But if it's a, the harder ones are are songs like Unsung that that's it, like all, every riff is sort of rhythmically displaced. You know what I mean? So it's not it's not in. It, I'm not in one position playing da da da. Da, 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 you know, da, 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 that, that I could do, but da, 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 and the vocal, you know, so I, I lay out in the verse, I, I guess if I wanted to spend time doing that, I could, I mean, I know I could, but I, I like that that one live has the band playing that rhythm part. And then I jump in the chorus and the chorus gets bigger, you know, that, that right. works, that works, you know, beautifully. Meantime's another one. 
it's because it's even though that is you know a, a regular pattern we have the the little the little hiccups in there so da 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 or da 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 right right that's that's too hard that's i don't know I have no idea how Getty Lee does it, man. I, I mean, he's because he can't lay out, you know. I mean, no. that's, you know, he can't. I mean, he's a fucking monster. I mean, just incredible, man. Yeah, you know, it's something you said about uh, ACDC and technique and uh, Ornette, and you know, it's obvious when you listen to Ornette's music. Uh, I reviewed the reissue of his first couple of records a couple of years back. They reissued like deluxe edition and like a little box set. And uh, I, I, um, I went to high school and I'm friends with Ira Gidler's son. And so he grew up with like jazz all in his house. But we used to go to metal shows together. Uh, as, oh, that's, as, that's cool. Yeah, as teens. And um, we stayed in touch. He sent me a bunch of reviews of that first Ornette record. And he's like, man, people were up in arms. And like, like the whole like critic and jazz community was like, just, yeah, and yeah. you know, it, in retrospect, after hearing how far out he went later, a lot of that stuff sounds really um, much less revolutionary than, than, than the way he was describing it because he went further and further. But my point was, it's clear he wanted to be on some kind of edge where there was an uncertainty and almost like he had to make a parachute in real time for something he had stepped out on a limb from, you know what I mean? Yeah. And there's yeah. that like sense of thrill in that music. And with that early helmet stuff, it's, it's a similar kind of, you can tell you're, you were trying to put yourself, um, maybe out of your comfort zone, like, like what you were describing. Yeah. The, the, um, the soul in particular, the solo style, I, and Tommy Victor, I had this conversation. He said that he's like, I'm, I've been trying to, to, you know, not cop, but kind of, you know, get your solo style because it's so unique and, and nobody plays like that. And I'm like, I, it was, it was kind of pissing into the wind and going, you know, I'm I, I the first solo I did was on repetition and I was playing fucking rock guitar 101 you know I mean and, and I and I would come in the control room I go god this sucks this is just like fucking sounds like I'm playing you know blues rock you know and Wharton said just stop thinking about it and so I I I had uh you know been working with Vanna Susan's before that I was on the Love Agenda album as you know and 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 Robert turned me on to, you know, using distortion and feedback and all that stuff. And so I put on, I put, I, I had a rat. I remember I had a rat and I had this Digitech, Digitech um, crappy GSP five, um, you know, pre for my solos. So I think I hit two distortion things off. So the guitar was just like, like kind of you know, practically vibrating out of my hands. And so it was, it became this sort of combination of playing pretty you know, like straight ahead stuff, pentatonics to, um, uh, you know, or speed modes or whatever to, to try to control the instrument and letting the, letting this stuff sort of, and like I always liked to how Howard Roberts used to talk about, um, uh, you know, wrestling the alligator or something. So I thought of it kind of like that. He said, he said, you can talk about it all you want, but you just got to get in there and do it. You know, if, if you want to learn to wrestle the alligator. And so it, I ended up, and I knew, you know, I had trans, I had transcribed hours and hours and hours and hours of music. Obviously, John Coltrane live, uh, Afro Blue Impressions. I have Cousin Mary. I have, I found that notebook the other day. It's like, God, I'm maybe 10 pages in and I think I stopped or something. He's, he's improvising for like, you know, forever. Um, and, and, and West Montgomery as well. You, you transcribed a lot. Didn't, didn't you? Trans Transcribes uh, uh, the whole song, uh, tune, uh, So Do It, which uh, I just pulled that out the other day because I we're, we're starting the tour in Indianapolis. So I'm going to go visit his grave and uh, I want to try to find his house. And I just watched that documentary, um, uh, uh, Westbound. Uh, I had never seen it before. And, uh, you know, of course, cried when he died. And I've known my whole life that he was dead since I was eight, but still, still hurts. You know, it's still like, fuck. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of Wes, a lot of Clifford, uh, you know, Clifford Brown and Miles, I transcribed um, 
trying to think think uh, what else I well I, my my first one was Wardell Gray my uh, my teacher who I bought my ES one seventy five by, uh, by uh, from back in seventy nine or whatever he um he had me transcribe uh, Twisted you know uh, the um, uh, which it, when Annie Ross turned into a vocal song my analyst told me that I was right out of my head which is all taken from the Wardell Gray solo um, on that uh, blues. Um, and um, trying to think of other stuff that I uh, that I've come across, and yeah, I'll find stuff in my 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 um, accordion folder that I carried under my arm with my classical guitar to Germany when I studied in 1982 over there. I was on the on a bus in Germany, and I had my backpack, my classical guitar, and a hard shell case because there wasn't such a thing as a gig bag in 1982, as far as I know. And uh, and then I had my 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 accordion folder with all my music in it. it's just total dork the bus driver stopped quickly one time in tubigen and uh and i started to fall my guitar fell and these old german ladies were yelling at the bus driver and you know it's like oh it's like a bit bitter. you know it's so sweet they're looking after you know this long-haired dumbass american but um <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 I I love I I still I still obviously sit down and if I figure figure like a chord progression out or something if I'm just sitting there and noodling or you know I, I, you know corny stuff like I'll play my girl or something it's which uh, you know C major pentatonic whatever but you know and sing it to my girlfriend you know because she was living in New York and so yeah, anyway just it's it's music I think a lot of rockers learned. By figuring out solos and songs and stuff but there's something that transcribing jazz solo, solos does and also writing it down for me that was good and got me away from my instrument a little bit and so i you know i think i'm not i'm no great you know i'm no virtuoso or whatever i because my first love is really is writing you know is, is writing music and i i like i mean there are some you know i can play fast you know uh, but it doesn't seem, but it, it does it serve a purpose? You know, if it does, yeah. Like the, the first song on the new album, um, I just wanted to do a double time, like the kind of the Ironhead groove double time for the solo. And, um, you know, so there's some, you know, some fast stuff in there. And I, you know, I'm not going to learn that solo. I'm going to improvise it every night. Well, I was just going to say, I was, so when you were talking about your solos, it seems like you never uh do your solos according to what the what they're like on the record it's almost like you're always free forming it but for the most part the songs like like i care um that is a is a more of a the solo is more of a melodic part and you know um because i just love that that sort of little lydia you know that little uh you know I kind of like, I kind of feel I should turn my stuff on, but, um, uh, but for the most part, it's, I'm improvising, you know, and I think, um, I, I've, I think I feel, you know, part of me has guilt, um, for my bandmates having, you know, cause I'm, I'm, they're, they're vamping while I'm, you know, like on uh, turned out in particular, um, that's a, just a vamp and Stan, you're used to always, you know bitch at me about how difficult that groove is um in the and turned out that where i'm soloing and uh so i i'm aware you know but it's kind of it's part of the gig at one time i was fucking with him um i had two side by side four by twelves and and he had complained to me about having to play that groove for so long for the solo and uh so i went over and laid down on top of my cabinets facing him and crossed my legs like like this and just watched him and he's you know just to fuck with him and got him laughing or whatever but you know it i love i don't know there's it i'm not playing jazz changes you know but i'm playing jazz changes like i like i i'm i've transcribed enough stuff and come up with my own theories about how they how they you know how guys did stuff like mike stern you know, playing a pentatonic scale a half step above whatever sort of key or mode or zone you're in, you know, but using the tri the flat five, you know, so playing a blues scale, but using the flat five to slide into a new key and then sliding back on the flat five. Um, 
you know, there's stuff, but I, I just like to go. I just like to let it kind of come out. You know, I'm like, I, I did a clinic with John Abercrombie when I was in college and he said, he said, yeah, I practice and I work on all these things. But when, when I, when it comes time to play, I just play and I just use my ears and that's all I'm doing, you know? And, and, and the older I get, the more I do this, the more I realize, you know, and I've been studying Barry Harris lately, like really digging in to those, uh, you know, uh, major and minor diminished, uh, uh, major minor six diminished scales that he, he, he uses and, you know, uh, ways to approach, um, it's, you know, and Monk, I, Monk, he, they talk about Monk saying a minor seven flat five chord is just a minor six chord with a six in the bass, you know? Um, so, so, you know, C minor six equals A minor seven flat five. I discovered that in 1980, maybe. And I excitedly called my guitar instructor, Gary Hagberg in his philosophy department office. He was a philosophy grad student, but he was, a, he had a bachelor's in music and in psychology. And he, he teaches philosophy at Bard College, but I call him like, Hagrid, C minor six is A minor seven flat five, you know? And he's like, it's an excellent Hamilton. He goes, uh, for your lesson tomorrow, come in and play it through in all 12 keys with voicings. And I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> but, you know, but that shit and that shit is fascinating to me. The point being, the six is such a powerful note. I mean, the tritone obviously is rockers are fascinated with it or the sharp nine you know uh tax man or you know uh, earth, earth wind and fire jimmy you know everybody calls it the the they call it the hendrix chord or or the you know the the, the seven sharp nine is that what rockers call it uh, um you know shine star or uh, i can't even think there's a million songs that use it but like uh, i think average white band right uh, um pick up the pieces and have a sharp nine chord anyway um that's a great chord. It's a great tension, you know, so is a tritone. It's a great tension, but you know, Marilyn Manson. Um, but the six, there's something about the six that just like it's bebop, you know, like the, um, Eleanor Rigby, you know, a, a, a Dorian, and then he resolves to a C major. So that C sharp becomes a C natural. And it's, that's a really, I don't know. That's a really powerful, tension to me the six and I, I i don't know i've been kind of really into that and i'm, you, I'm when, I, when i'm improvising i'm listening I'll, i might you know start something on a on a minor you know uh minor arpeggio and and i'm in d minor or whatever so we're, we're in drop c now but so there's a lot of c minor um but uh it's it's i don't know it's just fun to improvise and not play a bag of licks you know uh, like every night and, and i like that i like a bag of licks you know but but uh i think angus i think angus improvises a, a, a lot like i mean you hear those pianistic kind of pentatonic things he does but his rhythm is so you know he just seems to kind of you know, like get uh, uh, you know over the bar line and stuff i remember learning everything on the highway to hell like 30 years ago like just playing through the album one day and like getting some riffs and licks and stuff that he played. And, you know, I can't remember any of it, I'm sure. But, um, and I, so that's kind of, I don't know, for me, the point is not to be able to verbatim play something that one of your heroes played, but to just absorb it, you know? And John, John Stoll turned me on to that. He's like, listen actively and learn stuff. You don't have to try to re reproduce it. And I think I see so many kids on YouTube and they're like, look, I'm playing the solo note for note from i'm like how about just learning and absorbing it and then i have i'm superstitious so like really superstitious so i don't want to trap myself into i just want it all to be in there and then have it come out when it needs to come out you know i don't know it sounds weird i'm a hippie from oregon so so what you're saying you're ge you're 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 not just superstitious in a figurative sense musically you're saying you're genuinely superstitious overall yeah. Oh yeah. Like baseball, my, you know, my baseball things and sitting in the right place and, you know, wearing the right cap. And, you know, it's my, 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 my I think I get it from my dad. We're both, we, we, he took me to my first Oregon Ducks. No, my first Oregon Ducks football game was with the Brewers, Mr. And Mrs. Mr. Brewer. Uh, but uh, dad took me to a game and I don't know, we just, it was a great father son kind of thing. And then the whole family was started going and we, I, I guess it's a, you know, it comes from sports, but um, I, I think I'm also, um my brother and i 
discussed this one day and it made me really happy that he does the same thing that we have this weird thing for, for, um, uh, like counting, like yeah, if you're in a, a doctor's office and there's glass, glass brick wall, I have to know how many there are. And he, my brother said, yeah, I do that too. And I'm like, whew, God, okay. So I'm not completely crazy, but <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, there's a, a, a thing about music, like, it sounds hypocritical, but because because I know there are people who say I don't want to learn too much theory, and then lose my inspiration. And as Howard uh, talks about in the Guitar Compendium, Howard Robertson Gary Hagberg wrote his, his three volume Guitar Compendium, which is an amazing volume of uh, ed, guitar educational material. I mean, the best thing probably ever written for the guitar, in my opinion. I mean, they're two of my heroes, but um, the opposite is true. But you know, you you apply. You, uh, you apply theory and study something that pick one concept. Like I'm looking at turnarounds from Jamie Abersold right now. So I'm gonna play through turnarounds in all 12 keys. Uh, that's, a, that's a one, six, two, five, standard one, six, two, five. So major, minor, um, uh, you know, one, minor and, and five, you know, the, the, uh, the six and two, not dominant, not turning in dominant. So you work on that stuff. And, and you might figure out some patterns to play through rhythm changes of one, six, two, five. But then when it comes time to actually play, you don't want to just, you know, kind of regurgitate stuff that you practiced. Right. So hopefully your ears, what I try to say to my students is you're developing your, your, your the connection between this and this and this. And, and, you know, it, it, yes, yeah, sometimes you're going to play something that you've played a million times. You know, I, I do like to start the give it solo on that B flat major triad at the beginning of the solo. I just, there's something about that. But when I played the solo, I wasn't thinking about it and it kind of goes, so I'm kind of playing B flat Lydian, but it's really a D blues groove in a way, you know, if, if mm-hmm. you know, ba, da, 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 da. But it feels swampy and bluesy if you play it on an acoustic guitar and drop, and drop tune. But um, that that note, you know, uh, that that E, that E natural, if you're in B flat playing in B flat linear, feels really good. And it's just the nine in that key, kind of. I don't know. It's modal, so it's hard. It's a modal tune. All my solos are like a modal world, so it's. It's not like I'm playing giant steps, you know, and I got to keep up with chord changes or whatever. But but playing giant steps contributes to what comes mm-hmm. out when I am doing that kind of thing, you know. Well, and what I was gonna say, what I was gonna say was, I think what's interesting is about people who uh, completely mold themselves after what someone else does. I always thought that was you had to force yourself not to be original. That that any person will absorb whatever they're hearing and it will naturally express itself. It'll, you'll sort of sweat, you'll sort of sweat your own sphinx style. It's it just, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, like to do what you're talking about with the YouTube clips and everything where, where people are just like, it's like choreography, right? They're like learning a dance, right? On, on the drums or whatever. Yeah. Um, I just feel like people don't have to search for their own style. It just naturally occurs. I never understood this. Like you have to block yourself to, to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, the, the guys in way back at, at Oregon and guys saying, you know, guitar, the guitar players I met that they didn't want to learn theory or didn't want to, you know, in, you know, impede their inspiration. And I, I never got that. I said, I did I never wanted to limit myself to, and and the, the reason I chose music or it chose me or whatever, I mean, I was, I would, I, my sister and my family, and many people know this story well, but I was a freshman in college and I was a pre-med major because my parents said, you're going to college and you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer. And I was like, uh, okay. And I knew I wanted to be a musician. And so back then I lived across the street from Hayward Field, um, which was a waist high cyclone fence and you could hop over the fence and, in the middle of the night. So I went and I'd lay on my back and look at the clouds and the stars and the moon and go sit up in the, in the stands and kind of meditate. And, and I made a, I kind of had this whole plan for how I was going to, what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I wanted to do something that I, that I was felt fulfilled by and excited by not be a CPA or a banker or a lawyer or a doctor. I knew I couldn't be a doctor because if I see blood, I'd, you know, faint, but, um, and, and <laughs> I, I, I just kind of, you, you know, like, I somehow I just made up my mind 
that's the only thing that I could that I could uh, uh, could do. And I was so fascinated by. Um, and I, want, I wanted something, you know, again, point being, I wanted to do something with that was going to last me the rest of my life. Meaning like I, I was a ski racer. So and I, that was the thing I loved as much as music back then. And I knew at 30 years old or 35, I'd be done racing and I'd be teaching old ladies how to snowplow. And I knew music was never, ever, ever going to end. I was never going to master every aspect of music. Like I'm studying, I've studied orchestration. I've studied, you know, harmony, obviously, you know, tons of learned. I must know 150 jazz tunes. I study it every day, even if it's 10 minutes or 15 minutes in the morning before I go out the door, I play the guitar with my coffee and it's never bored me. Not one fucking time. Never. And when I, when I meet my friends that are rock stars and they got a guitar shaped pool and they're writing songs with other people because they got a lifestyle to support and they hate music and, and they hate each other. And I'm just like, God, what a bummer, man. Like what a bummer. I'm, ne- I'm people are like you're 63 and you're still so excited about it. I'm like, what's not to be excited about, man. It's, it, it uh, we're still studying western music you know i mean the same 12 notes right right and there, there's an unlimited you know combination of ways to combine these 12 notes whether it's you know zap i mean zappa like looking at, at his approach was so guitaristic when you look at his orchestral stuff or his the way he was writing these parallel you know things i'm like that's a guitar player's brain you can see it you know and it's fucking amazing i mean i just I just love, I love him. I got to see him in, in my Joe's Garage tour. Um, I met Dweezil and I met uh, Gail and I met Diva, um, who were, they were lovely. All of them all were really cool. Um, and uh, I met Dweezil twice, but I, I met Gail and um, Diva at a, at a um, anniversary or wedding party or something like that. No, it was a, a, a 50th anniversary for my, my dear friend's parents. Uh, there, the Zappa house is across the street from one of my best friend's sisters in, okay. um, up, up in Laurel. And, uh, so they were neighbors and they came over and I had, it was just so great. Gail actually went, went back across the street and got me this rare live thing, uh, uh, double CD that they'd never released and gave it to Whoa. me. And I, like, she was hilarious too, like really a great lady and diva was gorgeous and cool and and you know she teased her yeah gail she had a she had the zappa mustache tattoo and uh said gail said you know she's like all italian girls get their father's mustaches you know and i was like you know just really witty lady like i was just really blown away and, and uh so you know it gives me goosebumps thinking about it because i loved frank so much man and, well, and that's even before you get to microtonal music or other systems i mean you're you're it, what it, you're it, saying it, what you're saying is like Zappa is sort of the apotheosis of what you can achieve in this system. And you, then you can jump to another universe. So you'll never run out of time for it. You could have 15 ever, lifetimes. Ever, 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 you know, and, and, and I was, I had to make a choice at one point. Um, Cause I said, st- I got my bachelor's in classical guitar and jazz guitar, both. So I had a double kind of double major. And at, at a certain point I'm like, you know, I'm not going to probably make a living as a jazz musician, but I love that music so much. And it is a course of study that I, that really appeals to me. And it's, it's a daily course of study. It's, it's yeah, you're still a student. You're still a jazz student in a sense. You're living a, a life of jazz scholarship. basically. Exactly. hundred, hundred, hundred percent. You know, I, I still have, I'm surrounded by, by, you know, by books and theories and, you know, I have my fret, um, fret boards, you know, to write out scales. I think, um, you know, there's a, one of the Barry Harris concepts is, is expand and contract. So it's writing, you know, starting a scale and ascending and descending at the same time. So working out little things like that or learning his diminished six scale and then trying to apply uh, that to, you know, I mean, some of this stuff I knew, I mean, obviously a diminished, you know, a diminished seven chord is, you know, functions as a dominant you know, uh, chord, but it's, it's another approach to it. It's an, it's, it's coming down the railroad track this way instead of learning, Oh, I can play a minor seven flat five chord on the third of a dominant chord. And it's an, it's just a nine with no root, you know, a ninth chord with no root. I mean, I knew these things, but then like looking at Barry's approach, which seemed to be Monk's approach and Monk is one of my all time heroes. And obviously Coltrane studied with Monk and became John Coltrane. He was already John Coltrane, but when he studied with Monk, then he was like, yes, you are God, you know, um, and, and that, you know, so that it's never, it's a humbling, 
I think the thing about a lot of rockers is that world, that lifestyle, um, they think that they've arrived and that there's something special. And I know that I'm not, I'm just a musician and I'll never achieve what John Coltrane or Wes Montgomery or, or Thelonious Monk or Shostakovich, you know, my poor girlfriend, she gets subjected to Shostakovich, you know, in the car a lot. And, and she's like, this is pretty dramatic. I'm like, sorry, sorry, let's put on the Beatles. <laughs> you know, she, like, you know, so we're, we're driving somewhere to a, like a party year from 4th of July. And it's like, you know, it's like driving rhythm and this incredible, incredible music. But uh, um, yeah, I just feel like it's, it's a great career. You know, if you want to be a musician, if you want to be a pop star rock star i don't i don't know i don't know about that like i don't i you know a lot of people are like my you know i love your instagram i'm like great thanks that's cool you know it's so like my manager's wife who's like my sister and their son they help they do all that stuff and i um they they know that you know I, how i they know me well enough to know that i'm not going to say some you know something like hey rockers you know the, the new album drops or what you know so they're, they're right, kind of, right. but it, I think, and I understand social media is important. And I do the thing I've done for years and years and years post COVID, I won't be doing it, but uh, was sit on the edge of the stage after a show and talk to everybody and sign stuff and do photos. And I can't, I can't afford it now. I'm too old. And I got COVID in June uh, last year and it was, it was really, really sick, like deathly ill. And it really set me back but uh it's really rattling it's very it's a very rattling oh my god it's intense yeah i was mm -hmm. just like i was i've never been that that um depressed uh because I, I just i i don't know it was a really weird uh thank god one of my dear friends whose son is my godson and his you know, his wife is like my sister they have this basement in connecticut separate from the house and like it's a whole apartment so i i sat i was down there for about a week and he was he sweetly was bringing me meals and stuff. And, um, but it was, it was, it sucked, man. I went back to America. Like, I mean, I, I was figuring out America songs, you know, just, it went back to my youth. It did. It, it just took me back to this time when I was 12 and like, fucking hey, man, this is, you feel like you're going to die, you know, and, and uh, just, you can. And the cognitive most, effects. Yeah. 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 It's very it, it's strange. Right. Really strange. Yeah, very I, difficult. Everything, it, food was disgusting and everything smelled, to, what, for me, everything smelled like greasy, like dirty uh, uh, French, uh, oil, like French fried grease, like the sheets, my clothes, everything. I kept washing stuff and, kind of, you know, my friend, my friend's wife kind of like, he, he, we just washed these. And I'm like, it smells like French fried grease, man. We got to wash it. I just, I can't, all this stuff, everything was like, ugh, God, it was just, just awful. So it's, uh, so I don't, I can't do that anymore, but I still... I do. I've made some of my lifelong friends through our music, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and through meeting people that and the the thing that doing these lessons, I've made new new friends, you know, sure. like like guys that are regular students. So, uh, uh, and like I have a student in London, Nick, who's studying. He's we're basically uh, he's a theory, theory and composition student, basically mostly theory, music theory student with me. So we. And he he'll bring things up that I never even thought about. It's like, what's the Byzantine? I'm like, well, I don't know. Let me let me let me look into it. And then, so, you know, so I'll harmonize a Byzantine scale. I'll look up a Byzantine scale and then harmonize it. And go, this is really interesting, you know. And uh, that's what kind of got me into the Harris thing. One of my students in St. Louis asked. Um, she really wanted to. She know about this six thing. And and I go I go well. I have this Alan Kingstone book. That's the you know uh, great book by the way. He did a he was a student of Barry Harris, but sort of Barry Harris for guitar. Um, and um, so I, I, you know, started messing with that stuff and, and, and approaching tunes in that way, you know, like I say, from a different angle coming, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know, I just think, I think music is, um, it's just a never, it will never end, you know, there's never, you know, oh, I, I go back to my point about classical versus jazz. I was like, I was never going to be Andre Segovian. <laughs> it's also never going to be West Montgomery, but I could take those influences and, and kind of become me, you know, what, you know, cause I knew I, I knew the reason I was in music was because of Led Zeppelin, you know, and the, and the Beatles and then George Benson and Grant Green and Miles, all that stuff that you just discover along the way that that's what made me want to be a musician. And, you know, Wes, I came to West probably, I came to Grant Green first 
because my teacher was really into Grant Green, uh, one of my teachers. And um, but George was the one that my mom, you know, I bought my mom, I think, a Benson album for her birthday in uh, one year and um, and was crapping myself just like, what the hell is this? Um, but it's it's uh, it, the classical thing is a whole different technique. You know, you have to maintain your nails. And when I'm playing helmet shows that this nail gets shredded, you know, and, and um, so that it just isn't wasn't practical. I'll still pick it up every once in a while and try to fumble through a Bach, you know, gavotte from the cello suites. And and it's mind blowing music, obviously. And, you know, I went to Bach's grave at the church in Leipzig. And, you know, I hit a helmet pick under the pew. Um, <laughs> we don't know if that's we don't know if that's such what well, Bach would see that as a tribute or desecration, right? <laughs> I know, right? I know. You know, I'm just like I'm just hoping some of his genius will rub off on the pick and it'll somehow be in the you know atmosphere and I'll breathe it in, you know, and uh whatever. But uh and it's never gonna they're never gonna find it because it was all cobwebby and dusty and, and <laughs> that's pretty yeah, the, yeah and the pews face sideways too. It's like they're there's he's buried up there the flame and you know the apse of the church and then the pews are facing this way which is it's very strange very strange but maybe we're just pretty, not supposed to maybe we're just not supposed to directly behold the genius apparently from yeah. that grave site right <laughs> it might, yeah, apparently, might be apparently. too much here's here's what i would suggest that just occurred to me uh this morning what you're what you've done with your body of work in helmet specifically not not, yeah. not not so much the scoring uh yeah and and uh, these other things you've done but um it seems like all of that learning and awareness of harmony and um and like studio layering with like zeppelin and and like those lush arrangements you know, even Black Sabbath has that as well. I, it seems like all of that expresses itself in your music most naturally as timbre, which is not to say there's not harmony. I mean, there, you, you know, you've talked about a lot of the sort of the theoretical basis with Helmet, but it seems like the timbre is itself a form of harmony and everything that you've talked about, how you, that you appreciate in other people's music um got um distilled into that how how does that land with you yeah i um i th i think as uh, something i talk about with my students and something that i've always you know spencer barton one of my when when hagberg went away for a while he passed me off to his friend spencer barton he's the one i bought my es 175 from he's the one that had a john coltrane poster on his wall so i have a john coltrane poster on my wall uh well i have two actually one of the entryway and one in here and Sonny Rollins and Clifford, you know, and I have a train picture and in, in the last train, I have a 19 original press of uh, 56 pressing of another train, but he, the, what the one note thing, the note, what a note is all the music that is in one note. So the sound is everything, you know, and, and like orchestration is a study of sound, right? It's, it's, you know, you're not going to combine, uh, you know, one trombone, you know, uh, one, one saxophone with one flute because pitch uh, intonation, I should say, uh, in wind instruments is iffy. So you can have two of each, but you don't want one of each, you know, and things that you learn about sound and, and the guitar distortion, Robert Poss and, you know, turning me on to distortion and then Casper Brotzman helping, helping expand my mind with distortion like that, that, that's the that sound, you know, for, for me is fascinating. You know, Glenn also, we were doing a symphony number six, six. On, six. Yeah. I'm on that recording and we were doing it at bang on a can. Um, I forget the name of the venue. It was a really cool little theater. And I want to say it was on, um, it was on Robert Poss's street across Avenue A. Uh, so, so, uh, is that fourth, I believe fourth street between B and C south side of the street there's this little cool theater um god damn uh oh, oh, oh i almost had it. uh ah. anyway there was a balcony and i and uh we we're practicing but i said uh i went i said glenn i'm gonna go take a leak and i want to go upstairs he's like oh, i can't you know and so i i leave and i go upstairs to the balcony and they were playing so this was symphony for was it was it nine guitars i believe nine electric guitars and uh and uh and then the drummer was 
Steffen at the time. I think it wasn't Wharton. I think um, it's 10. I think it's 10 guitars. 10, yeah, yeah, maybe 10. And I was, I heard it with nine because I was sitting upstairs. I wanted to hear it. And we're talking about you know, guitars tuned to all E's and all B's. Soprano, alto, tenor. Uh, did we have a bass, soprano, alto, tenor? Did he have a bass? I don't, I, I don't remember. Um, I don't think we did. Uh, oh, he had, he had the harmonic guitar, that guitar he invented, the long thing. Um, and I was up there sitting, I closed my eyes and hearing these chords and uh, also Glenn's system of notation at the time were with a, with a series of numbers and shapes. So mm -hmm. one, two, one, two, three with slashes over the one staircase was an was a major triad shape but if you're playing a guitar tuned to all e's that's going to be uh, those are going to be chromatic notes obviously so i was hearing like, like tr you know, roar of trumpets i was hearing angel choirs choir i was hearing all this stuff in the upper tertials and so like people that are so fascinated by playing a million notes are missing the beauty of all the notes that are hap that are happening up here the sound you know the they're rubbing together the 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 the, the, the um the tactile uh transients and overtones of all overtones. these things it's like, it's like rushing it's like rubbing fabric together right you get this 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 sensation in your fingers when you do that like you, you can almost touch it they're, they're missing that they're missing like the I, I want to call it the, the, the third dimension or something you know like hearing everything hearing the note they're playing and the effect they're using a flanger a chorus when i work with pedals i do i've done movie stuff for years and years and years some of this i call it my shit sculpting but noise stuff that that uh i got you know uh casper and i we made that zulu time album and robert so robert and casper again kind of influenced that and i just took it to you know to another you know, place and started working with Elliot Goldenthal, who's a fucking right. genius. For, on and Heat. Heat was the first movie I did, right. the first big, big movie, and just, get, you know, getting to experiment and Elliot loving that. But when I'm using a pedal, a, a pedal might have two, it might have three usable sounds, you know what I mean? And it's finding that, finding where it opens up. And if you combine two pedals, then you, it's going to, it might change where it opens up on each pedal, you know? I, uh, so like that's this, it's all about the sound and what is happening up here. And to me, that's, I don't know, that's what kind of lifts me up, you know? And that's that, so that, that sound is everything. There's something and you know, wire too, you know, them playing that one chord for 20 minutes or whatever they do. Um, and it's, there's some, I don't know, there's something hypnotic about it. I try to also, uh, I, I look back to be, being a Coltrane freak and knowing that he played his last show at the um, um, Baba Ola Tunji. It was on um, Ninth Avenue, I believe, the, the uh, little drum collective thing in New York. Um, and I got to see Baba Ola Tunji when I was a young man. Before I moved to New York, I was living in Seattle and make Baba Ola Tunji Drums of Passion came to Seattle and I played at this Chinese restaurant up, up, upstairs. And it was droney, hypnotic. It was just vocals and drums and dancing. And to be in this room with 150 people, you know, upstairs in Seattle, Washington, and, you know, dancing for two hours solid and just being swept up in this there weren't any you know complex harmonies there it was you know because one note in these choirs these voices you hear all this blend you know the, the blend of all these overtones all this beautiful sound and then that to me has always been so fascinating it's why i love orchestra music so much too not just not the only reason but but strings, you know, a guitar is a strings, it's stringed instrument, obviously. And, it, and Elliot, would, Elliot said to me, he's like, man, you're the distortion, your electric guitar, it's, it's, it's such an orchestral sound, you know, and it blends so well with what he was doing. And uh, how much had you yeah. ever thought of it that way prior to him saying that? How much did you ever consciously? Not, maybe not consciously, you know, but I had always, I think I, I always, uh, had that thing where I loved repetition and I loved that hypnotic, um, you know, uh, the, the 
state that you get into by repeating something that's interesting, you know, like when you look, look at the song Sinatra and it's over and over and over again, and you know, how the, it kind of breathes, it opens up and then there's the, the single note, you know, it, it goes to the unison because the guitar is the, uh, the B string is tuned up a minor third. So you get the unison when you play like a minor third. And then the major third is a, is that clashing kind of um, half step thing. That's it's so nice. And I always love that, but I never thought about I never thought about it in terms of an orchestra. So, so it never occurred to you until Elliot said that? Probably you. not. Yeah, I'd, probably not. Um, you know, I mean, I always approached it like that unconsciously, though, I think. I never thought, yeah, it is an orchestra. And so I, I knew I love the sound of distortion and I love the sound of strings. I, I've grown to learn more about about woodwinds you know and and uh, brass and stuff and woodwinds are because the, they're you know reed reed instruments double reed instruments have a, a similar kind of warmth to that, that string instruments do to me brass obviously not but i wrote a piece for brass uh, uh you know for winds uh, for the uh, 52 um, piece orchestra for the christian brothers high school in memphis tennessee it was there it's the oldest orchestra in america Hmm. um 150 anniversary so it was all brass and winds and i love it now and i uh, but it's it is it is jarring when the brass section comes in and you've had this like like adagio for strings there's no jarring moment it's so, so hypnotic it's like it's i want to say it's it's death it's like peace it's like okay this is where i want to be when i leave you know the physical you know planet and it and then brass is like you know like no it's, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, that's, brass is like being brass is like the sound of getting your ass slapped when you're just born maybe it's exactly like, it, 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 yeah yeah and it's and it's that's where the volume comes from in an orchestra that's the wow you know and and i am you know and i and i i love it i appreciate it but it's uh you know I was never a big Maynard Ferguson fan. I, I, I you know, look. Right, obviously, so, 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 so strings and timbre is something that sort of naturally appeals. For me, to, yeah. It's kind of a neat appeal. The, the guitar tones on the album Betty, which I told Perry, uh, and I, I feel comfortable saying this now that we've been talking for an hour. I don't, I don't usually like to share these kinds of details with artists, but um, I that is the album I've listened to the most at a stretch in my life from the day it came out. Like I was very pulled into that record for a year and a half, no exaggeration every day. And I was really high at the time um, a lot, but, but um, the, what the, the way I've described the tones on that record, it's like waterfalls of distortion where if you're looking at a waterfall and the sun is hitting it and you see the mist and sometimes you see these colors and you see this like mist to me, that's how deep that, that sound is the way it was captured. There's all these transients. There's so much information there. And that's where I think, you know, this idea, like, so I, when I hear that, it's the equivalent to me of like, this incredible harmonic depth which there is some of that as well but i just feel like there's you know you can almost you can almost stick your hand in this waterfall and feel all this mist on your face through the speakers oh it's interesting there's there there on um i had a thing on that album where i was you know kind of expanding what we you know we had started with strap it on and uh and it didn't start until Strap It On, Helmet, like official. Like we were, you know, Born Annoying was is uh, was not in drop tuning. Um, and nor was, you know, Shirley McLean or Dave Shigo and that stuff. And then I got the re repetition riff in my head walking home and I had the drop tuning. So that was, um, it's been this kind of constant progression of coming up with, because as a lover of jazz, I'm all, I'm playing chord melody. And so I'm coming up with new chord voicings and, so I'll have, I have certain jazz guitar arrangements that are, you know, voicings that are unique to me. And I have like double, weird double jointed fingers so I can play where, you know, I have other guitar players look at me like, what the fuck is that? And, you know, Danny in my band, he plays the, the helmet, cord, helmet chords differently than I do because his fingers don't bend the same way. Like I can bar with my middle and, uh, middle and third finger easily. 
and you know and play notes around them and so you're I'm, I'm kind of constantly trying to find new things but on that album i didn't you know the the song that comes to mind is tick um mm -hmm. in, the, in the chorus where i got this thing where i played this one chord and it's super simple, you know. It's it's, just, it seems to spread around the rest of the music, that chord. Yeah. That, the dissonance, it's just all, oh, again, it's like there's a cloud that just like envelops yeah. everything. Yeah, there's some of that on, on the album, where, you know, where I um, I got this, this kind of beautiful melody in my head for... Um, uh, bombastic, when I was... Um, I was kind of horsing around with uh, make sure if I plug where did I plug in here. Oh, I can't hear. I must be I must be going through the uh, through the board. Ah oh, fuck it. Oh I was writing last night, so I had, I must have got, I have to open logic. I mean, fuck it. Um, I, like, like I'm always trying to like come up with new chords. And so this guy is just like, basically if you were to play like a minor seven chord on the 10th fret and then lift it up to, to, so the G and E strings are open and then, and then held it bar on the bottom. So I got this melody. Very Glenn-like. And I never try to figure out what the chord is because they're not jazz chords. It's not like a dominant seven or whatever. It's like like this. If I was gonna, what would I call this? Well, there's a. This is not concert pitch, obviously, but I mean because I'm in drop C, but I still think in terms of drop D. Uh, so there'd be like an it'd be like an A flat major seven sharp five with a B flat and an F in the bass. But here's a there's a that's a pretty inside chord you can't hear it, but that's like an a flat major seven sharp five right on top top four strings and then anyway, going that b flat in the bottom it's just beautiful sound it's just i don't know what the chord is and i don't care it's that uh, why do you care where i come from that part the, the i think it's after the solo or before the solo i can't remember um and it's i think you know obviously in 1993 i was writing and singing differently than i am now you know i i'm not half the uh, i wasn't half the guitarist or singer that i am now i, I feel have so much more confidence in in, the, in every every aspect of that you know i mean i sang i'm singing on the kissing booth movie now you know what i mean like and, and people are like who's that beautiful voice and it's like dumbass fucking hardcore dude from new york from the you know from the 80s or whatever you know like that you know not that i'm that but that's how people you know post hardcore i guess we're post hardcore but i uh so i so every idea so the voice is now assuming the role of a lot, a lot of harmonic stuff you know like i uh, mark my vocal guy that i've worked with since i've been in la for 20 years and he's like god you're just like this you got harmonies on everything now like i know i'm hearing it i'm hearing these fourths a lot of fourths a lot of that kind of stuff and yeah you know, when we work with jay baumgarten he has a thing against fourths and i'm like really like i love fourths like <laughs> like you know modal music modal jazz music i is you know i that's kind of what brought got me into mute into jazz really because bebop was too crazy for me at first you know and and then you hear kind of blue and you're like whoa okay and you start hearing you know like you know uh bill evans tunes like nardis uh well it's a miles tune but bill evans kind of did the definitive version of it um and you you, you know just uh so I think there's, there, you know, I, I made room for the voice, you know, mm -hmm. more room sure. for the voice, you know, and back then I, I feel like my range was like an octave, you know, that was it. And, you know, so I either had my singing voice or my screaming, you know, my, my, mm -hmm. my heavy, my heavy voice. You but know, on that record, it starts to open up considerably as Absolutely. does the, you know, and, and meantime, there the appeal of meantime is how airtight it sounds like, right? It's very 
it's like sort of vacuum packed yeah right? all the air is like sucked out of the it's a very immediate it's like you know the symbols are like right here in, in the sonic yeah. field like right in front of your forehead and then yeah I, I like that that dry and we still like rhythm guitars are still dry as you know dry as a bone live and you know there's stuff on them you know a little bit but but i like you know i love acdc and i listen you know I zero in on that you know they're how their two sounds blend you know and i think mm -hmm. bands that some bands get i've worked with young bands and they'll have like you know six rhythm guitar tracks and i'm gonna do and all you're doing is is kind of emasculating the 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 the, the, the punch in the face you know that, that you right, say you're that. making it all smaller actually yeah exactly exactly you and know? you're like, making it thicker in a homogenous way it's like when you put um it's like when you um when you over stir eggs and flour and they just turn into like like lard basically <laughs> like like they just turn it's just too thick right yeah, yeah no... exactly it, it, exactly it's blend it's it's it, it is kind of almost homogenized i, I was my, my ex-girlfriend you know, a million years ago in eugene oregon we used to eat this nancy's honey yogurt which was i think ken kesey's uh um dairy in in springfield oregon it was this great you know hippie yogurt but it came with the jam on you know the stuff on top and I just like to dump it in and give it one swirl around, not like have it totally blended. Right, like, right, right. Actually, to, yeah, you know, I've never even thought of that, but that's a, that's a, that's like the perfect. That's like the perfect. You know, it doesn't breathe when you've got that much. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And it's 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 funny, and 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 kids that are not used to listening to to your music that way, and I just think you know, I, I ACDC sounds it just sounds so so good of the beatles like you know i mean two guitars and and i it just sounds so good and you and it, there's room for lennon to play the you know the triplet thing oh, oh, close your eyes you know if you had everybody doing that it's gonna sound you know not right insane. right so 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 th that's interesting because um I I just saw a YouTube clip recently that kind of blew my mind. Actually, I never knew this about Malcolm Young. I forgot who it was who was explaining it. It might have been an engineer that worked on one of their records. I think it had to be. It wasn't Mutt Lang, but it was somebody who had worked with them and said that um, he didn't use a lot of gain. So in his signal chain, so that when he would actually he would actually get his distortion by hitting harder. So there was this natural dynamic and this escalation of intensity wow, yeah. from, from his attack. That's cool. Which I was like, whoa, okay. And it kind of makes sense actually. And I actually prefer, like, I love the records where they sound huge. Like I love, uh, for those about to rock, I mean, they just sound massive on that record. But I also really love when they sounded like ratty. Me too. Uh, yeah. Uh, like yeah. Let There Be Rock. Like it's like two, it's like, it's like two teenagers in stock cars. Like those guitars are like, like you can hear them revving and like spitting up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, dirty, dirty deeds it's very raw and yeah no i agree i agree i love i love both both as well you know what i mean and, and um yeah but you know bond bond ties i mean brian is amazing but bond just he's he's my guy man i just like fucking greatest most underrated singer ever i think i just think almost like a, almost like a pre-punk in a way almost uh absolutely yeah yeah i agree Bond sort of way like this real street, <laughs> like, incredible, incredible man. And his his lyrics and just his delivery and just his, his sense of humor and and uh, I've been you know we've been out in um, at uh, Fremantle, been out to his grave a few times, and uh, yeah, man, God, he's he's uh, he was something. He was really something. What a band! What an incredible band! I yeah I um, yeah I, I've, I'm glad I got to see him. You know while they were all while it was the lineup still with Brian, I never saw Bond, but, but I got to see him, you know, with, with Malcolm and, and uh, Phil and um, it wasn't what Mark on bass, it was uh, Cliff. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was great. It was fucking, it was great. They're just as an experience too, to be standing next to fathers and their little kids with like the <laughs> blinking devil horns on little 10 year old kids and, at the forum in LA and God, it was great, man. Just really a fun, incredible band, man. I just, I still, I think it's the ultimate rock band. I, I just mm -hmm. love, we, we, we went to the stu their studio. I met uh, Harry Vanda, uh, okay. took, us on a, took us on a tour of the studio and I, I was just in awe. I was just, it was, it was so cool, man. They're just, I, I had a chance to meet him many, many years ago 
um, they were playing at the Meadowlands, I think in Jersey. And um, so they had me hooked up and I got a call to, uh, Helmet got a call to go tour at Nine Snails. So obviously that was a big opportunity and we were on the same label and the label, you know, label and Trent made it happen. And so I, it never happened, you know, and I'm like, oh, that was a great tour. And I got to know Trent and he's been great to me. And I've worked with, you know, in his studio with him and, and kind of got me through my divorce and everything, but man, fuck, ah, ACBC, like, oh God, it's just like, I wish I could have met Angus and Malcolm, you know. It's, I mean, you form a really strong attachment to the people you you admire, uh, music, to their music, I mean, and to, because I remember I interviewed you and right right before, no, nah, it wasn't, was it, it wasn't um, Size Matters, it was that Interscope Best Of compilation in 04. Oh yeah. Okay. And you said to me that that uh, in that interview you said, look, looking at like these indie rock bands wearing John Coltrane T-shirts is kind of like to me it's like what, looking at somebody wear a picture of like Jesus Christ or something on their T-shirt like that like yeah. that, that it was that it bugged you that people would so flippantly like you 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 I think what you were trying to say was that it wasn't reverent enough. It was kind of almost bringing him down to a level of putting him in pop culture, in this like indie pop culture paradigm in a way that- Yeah, I mean, yeah because it's because it's cool to like John Coltrane, uh, you know, or, or, or I don't know. Like I, I dealt with my share of um, cynicism, you know, c- c- crit- people critical of me early on because of, my naivety and it started with band of susans and uh because i didn't know there was a way you were supposed to behave or talk or or you know what you were supposed to listen to or who you were supposed to talk about there was like a code there was like a like an orthodoxy in to be to be cool yeah and i i i am so fucking stupid that i i i just always talk about what i love and 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 i and i've been burned for it and i a friend somebody i'm friendly with and toured with i won't say his name but somebody said oh so and so said you're a you're a dilettante and this is when helmet was blowing up so obviously when you're becoming really popular people are jealous and they turn into assholes and i saw it in new york i mean a lot you know backstabbing and heard all kinds of shit about myself and i was like i was like really and later when i met that person and we toured together and i sat down at a catering table and talked about Clifford Brown and he had never heard of Clifford Brown. And I said, Oh God, he's genius. I Man, he died in a car crash. He was 25 years old. And I said, I've transcribed, you know, Sandu, I've transcribed uh, Joy Spring solos and, you know, and, uh, and that at that moment, he realized I wasn't a dilettante that I know way the fuck more than he does. And he doesn't play jazz and I do. And so I'm, I have, I can talk about whatever I want to talk about because that's what, honestly what i listen to and what inspires me i'm not talking about it i'm not wearing a john coltrane shirt he's like you know because i want to be cool you know and i think like i just feel like you don't have to be able to transcribe john coltrane or play play a 251 or right, a giant, right. that's to be able to love his music i was just but gonna I, say but i but i do and 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 i don't deserve to get you know, bashed for, uh, because I, uh, you know, I talked about something that wasn't in the, in the cool kids club. I don't want to be in the cool kids club. I never did. I really, I mean, honestly, like I am, it's music first period. That's it. That's, that's what I love. And that's why I'm still so excited to do what I do. And, you know, I wake up every, every single day of my life, I'm thinking about it, you know, and I'm, and I'm working on something, you know, and uh, well, this goes, this goes both ways because, because, we were just talking about ACDC, and by the way, I'm sure you've seen the the the, the Paris or the the. I don't, actually, it's not in Paris. It's um. Is the Zenith somewhere, or somewhere in France? The the Let There Be Rock film, uh, which it's a concert movie that was only released in France at the time, but you can you, you can get it, you know, it's yeah, online the, too. I think it's at, at at the Zenith, I believe, right? And it's an amazing. Yeah like like just or even the oakland coliseum show that's on youtube and obviously the if you want blood live album yeah yeah and just the just the 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 feel those guys had like the sense of swing that is just intangible that you can't 
recreate. I even think they lost that. I don't hear that as much on Back in Black. I don't hear that as much later in their in their work. It sort of became this like sort of um, I don't know this like this like giant metal colossus or something, right? But like um, I know what you mean. Yeah, I, I I agree. Yeah, they sort of they sort of like get less and less. They sort of get further and further removed from that as they go along. Um, so. I, I interviewed Martin BC in 09. This is related to, um, but he he said that when he was living with Michael Jara, when they were roommates, Michael Jara would like, you know, poo-poo rock music as if it was this like overly simple thing that, you know, anybody could do in, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but this, and BC was like, th thought that he was wrong and he was missing, missing the point. But it, 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 it goes it goes in both directions too, because um, you have people who, it, what always pisses me off about bands like ACDC or Motorhead or the Ramones is that gives people license to just play shitty without understanding. It's just, it's the exact same. It's like just the opposite end of the continuum. It's like, Oh, yeah, I yeah. want to be this. I want to be this like technique. You got to learn technique or else you're not legit versus you have to be kind of shitty Cave, cave, yeah, caveman, yeah, yeah. Right, no, I, right. Yeah. And uh, it's clear that, like, in your listening, like that dichotomy is not, is not. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have friends that are not musicians; they're singers, you know. And and uh, a, a, a dear friend of mine studied with Ann Richter in New York, and she she had the great joke: and how do you know the singers at the door, like they can't find the key and they don't know when to come in. And I've experienced that. <laughs> with a singer who had a beautiful, has a beautiful voice, Angela McCluskey. She's a friend of mine and I like the wild colonials and stuff. And we've done gigs together, but she's not a musician. She, and I, I was play, I played Crimea river with her as well as, uh, what's the other song she likes to do? I can't remember. Uh, Oh, we did a recording of that one. We did try to do a recording of, uh, moon river, but she wants to do everything, you know, like the painfully slow, dreary pace. And I said, we had just did Crimea river you know, in a ball ballad way, let's do something else with Moon River. So it's not the uh, fucking same thing. But uh, she does, she doesn't get helmet and doesn't get ACD. You know, this is Paige and he's from helmet. He can do, he can play jazz, but he's in helmet. And I'm just, I'm like, fuck you, man. Like, but you probably like, got that, you probably got that from multiple directions, didn't you? Oh, wouldn't, yeah. My, from, wouldn't from, you say from, that like some of these avant garde noise people would have said the same thing about you and some of your jazz? like teachers oh and my, my 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 uh one of my uh, friends from manhattan school of music uh um she's a professor there now she played in my master's recital with me joan styles wonderful jazz pianist she doesn't get it and uh ed ed dunsavage a good jazz guitarist i like in my my hometown up at, well he's in ashland oregon uh, southern oregon uh teaches at southern oregon state university he doesn't get you know he's like yeah well Paige and he's like they start talking about you know we're doing clinics together for the brit kids uh brit festival kids and like hey, and pentatonic i'm like dude you've never listened to my fucking music don't they it, think don't, 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 wouldn't they say you're a dilettante in, or would they think the same thing that you're sort of out slumming it playing you know this barbaric stuff yeah wouldn't they so just like the other person was like oh you're a dilettante with jazz i feel like they were, yeah. they were looking at you. Oh, the yeah. Same no, way. there's, there's, there's no, there's no question. And I, and I used to take it personally, but I'm like, it's when people that are in, people that are in the crews or in a band or band, I played with a band. Uh, they, they said they knew six helmet songs and they couldn't get through one. And I'm like, um, we, I think we, we tried to play Milk Toast. And, and I'm like, this is uh, you, you, this is wrong. You're playing this wrong, <laughs> wrong. It was da 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 and James Brown and Miles Lane's people, he came to see us play once and he got on the bus and he was like, man, it was like, helmet's like a big bowl of ice cream. And then you dig in and there's spinach inside. And I'm like, I love that. You know, I love, or, or uh, uh, 
another hero, Steve Jordan and Danny Korchmar came to see us play. And we went out with them afterwards, my ex-wife and I, and those two. And Steve's like, man, you guys are the only heavy band that swings. It's like, it's just so fucking great, you know, and, and they get it. And those are musicians on a, a, another level, as far as I'm concerned. They're like Cooch and, and Steve and, and TM, they're, they're phenomenal. So Tony Thundersmith, you know, like meeting those guys and having them sing my, our praises, you know, and, and they get it. The people that don't get it are, you know, can, I don't know. I, 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 I'm Billy Gibbons or, you know, I met Elton. I'm, you know, and obviously play with Bowie and they were all like fans, you know, they're fan Elton. Like I, he was my hero when I was 12. I mean, I was like fucking America. Then Elton came along and, and he's like, I love you. I love helmet. And I'm like, what? Like right, you were I, surprised when Bowie, I mean, like no the, surprise. Oh, um, I laughed. Yeah. I met him in 97 at a, at a, at Schuttorf, I believe in Germany. And I had a copy of hunky dory in my back pocket on a CD to sign. Cause I, I was hoping I'd get to meet him. I'm, friend, I'm friends with Reeves. So Reeves, I saw him in catering and Reeves is like, come over here. And I, I hated to do it, but it's like fucking Bowie. So, <laughs> That's pretty funny because it would have been really hilarious if that had annoyed him. <laughs> I know, I know. But he was so cool. He's like, Helmut, I love Helmut. And I go, Pah! I say, I'm like, yeah, right. And he goes, oh, we go way back, you know, and he knew of Helmut and he'd heard it, but, and, but you know, it was just being kind, I'm sure. But, you know, I thought the same thing for, with Elton. Elton ain't sitting around listening to Helmet Records. He heard of us and he heard it. And he heard that there was something musical in there. You know, that, that it's, a, it's, it's, from, it's coming from a musical place, even though it's presented in a very aggressive, sure. uh, you know, and some people are put off by that, you know, like. Well, you know, I mean, and, and I, I think everybody draws their line differently because, because talking about the dilettante thing, like it always, pissed me off the quote the John Zorn quote and this is this is just me personally when John Zorn said and he meant this in a flattering way and he was like oh you know when I heard Napalm Death like there's grindcore what they're making to me it, it's like the, it has the same essence that I first heard in free jazz and I thought that's just such a snobby but I know what he's saying and I understand but it, it, it just struck me as like oh this dude like let me go to like the heavy metal ghetto and like, like, you know, when he played with yeah. Mick Harris in, on those first two painkiller records, he and Bill Laswell played with Mick Harris. To me, it's just so uninteresting that you just, okay, you've got the John Zorn doing his like wailing saxophone thing and you've got Mick Harris doing his thing. And it's like, it's almost like they said, let's just get this caveman because he, Mick Harris thinks of himself that way, which I don't think of as playing that way. Yeah. Now, when those guys started doing dub music, then to, I love that record. I love yeah. when, when they go to someplace different than just smushing together. So, I mean, you, you kind of get that in, in both directions. Like, it, like uh, it makes me uncomfortable that Sonny Rollins was soloing on fucking Rolling Stones. I, I think it's awesome, but there's something uncomfortable about that to me. Like, yeah, like, no, I, I know what you mean. I'm, you know, I, I, I read, you know, we've talked about, we started off talking about Steely Dan and I love Steely Dan dearly obviously and and I, and Wayne Shorter is right, right. all-time heroes ever I mean ever compositionally and impro improvisationally his approach to life everything about him I I worship and and he, he you know and I when well, he played Asia on record it, it, yeah it plays on Asia and it's great it's incredible I mean it's fucking beautiful but um Donald there's an interview with Donald and Walter and they're saying like uh, uh yeah, we love would if Charlie Parker was alive, we would have loved to have it. And I was like, oh man, no, oh yeah, okay, that's taken a little too far. No, <laughs> right, right, right. That's right. fucking Charlie Parker, man. Like he's not playing on a pop record. I'm sorry. I just and so it's borderline, you know, but it's beautiful and and it takes nothing away from you know uh, Phil Woods or um, uh, um, uh, who's it, uh, is it Tom Scott that did a lot of their horn arrangements, right? Right? Yeah. I'm Tom not Scott. sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, but, but it's Tom, always... Scott, Tom Scott. Those guys, but those guys always did that kind of fusion crossover thing. And but Wayne, you know, Weather Report is not fusion. That is art on the highest level. You know, and that is some heavy, heavy shit. Even Birdland, you know. I mean, and uh, 
but but I'm like Charlie Parker. No, you can't. No, you, 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 don't don't say that. Please don't say it. You know, it's there's like, something I, about I, it. There's something about it. Almost like getting like a Hall of Fame athlete to be your first base first base coach or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. that. Like that. Yeah. It just it just it just feels a little bit. It, I mean, again, I, I love both those examples musically. Um, I think the Stones, obviously, and Steely Dan had a ton of respect for for their yeah. musical yeah. elders. It's, it doesn't come off disrespectful, but there's something I almost would say no if given an opportunity like that. It's almost like ah, I don't want to. Yeah, no, I know. It's I know. like you're yeah. not going to invite Picasso to teach your fucking kindergarten class. Yeah. I'm not saying that music is kindergarten, but you know but, what I'm but, saying. But but will I? But what I will, will say is, as a student of jazz and as a you know person who's religion is kind that's kind of in a weird way my religion if, if that makes sense there the when every person i've met from you know and shook shake i got to i got El, elvin hugged me uh mm. mel waldron stood politely talking to me um you know like face to face you know in like these musicians there's a there's a, a humility there's a humbleness in musicians on that level that nothing it, john stoll one of my great heroes and mentors he's like buddha he nothing is been you know beneath you you're you're not thankful for the opportunity but you're you're not they don't hold them they don't consider themselves better i do we do like sonny rollins is so you know far above the stones and you know and and when sure is so far of us you, you know and, and i love the stones to see them but these are to us, the, these are Beethoven, Mozart, right. you, know, uh, uh, you know, and Bach, and um, but they, for them, it's about music. And Wayne was, I just think they're so humble. The thing, the thing about our culture is, or it's so starfucker uh, hierarchy. When you see see footage of Led Zeppelin or Hendrix, and there's schmucks walking around behind the drum kit during the show you know the beer or whatever it's and now it's like we got to go in our dressing room when marilyn manson you know goes on stage or leave the venue you know i couldn't watch sound check you know like oh, rock really? stars are, are rock stars are the shit doesn't stink and there's something and i i hate that i I've, I've always hated that i hate that there's some hierarchy i don't i'm not you know i'm i feel humbled by music but and i have friends and bands that are you know, huge. And I'm, you know, uh, I, I don't feel at all inferior because they've sold 10 or 20 or 30 million records. And I haven't, you know, I, I, mm -hmm. I just, I don't, I feel like they can't do what I, I do, you know, and I can, you know, probably do what they do. I, you know, I can learn their songs in a minute and, and it's like, doesn't mean it's not good, but it, it's much less interesting to me than, you know, trying to st still trying to figure out how to play Little Rudy Tootie, and I played it at my master's recital in 1983. You know, and it's and, still and it still holds some mystery or some some still, sense of having to having to to learn still uh, or, still to this yeah, day like I a mountain to like, climb or something. Yeah, yeah, like wow, how did he even conceive of this? Like you know that first right. chord that eh, 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 you know and. Uh, but, yeah. right. I, I mean, you know, and again, I, I love those two songs that I mentioned, and I think I, I too, love that they did it. I just, I just feel like, man, like if you were in, if you were one of those artists, would you be like, ah, that? Do we really, do we really want to bring one of these people? Um, and and like I said, it goes, it goes in the other direction too. I, I, um, I live uh, near the Eastman School of Music, so there's lots of conservatory students that I've met, and they, they, they love like you know underground music. They love a lot of them love noise and hip-hop and and metal and you know and i think that's that's killer that's awesome but sometimes it comes off as like as like the like the john zorn example i gave for me i don't even know if that's really what he i don't know if he was being condescending but sometimes it feels to me like oh let's just get these heavy metal savages he and, he, he phoned me when, while we were making betty i was in the studio and zorn phoned me uh, you know I, I met with laswell a couple of times he wanted to do a project with uh ted parsons and i and uh, it never came to to fruition and and zorn phoned me about doing something but i just was too busy you know the band was was uh, where i was you know i'm the singer and the writer and the you know producer or whatever and uh, and and of helmet and the band leader and it's 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 time consuming you know and i and i just we were touring 
nonstop back then, like literally, like, you know, and, and I was interested, you know, I know Patton uh, worked with him, um, you know, and, and uh, so, I mean, I, I, I can dig what he does, but I don't know, you know, his aesthetic, where he's coming from. I don't know if he, I don't know, not that this matters, but I don't know if he can play, uh, you know, I know Alan Holdsworth can play Isotope from Joe Henderson. I don't know if John Zorn can, you know, I mean, mm. not that that means anything, but to me, I got this purest thing about jazz. It's like, I don't consider myself a jazz player. You know, I'm not right. John, Schof I'm not John Schofield, you know, I mean, like I, I hold him in like way above myself. Like I'm, I'm just a guy. I'm, that's why I have my little jazz wannabe group. Like I want to be, you know, when I grow up, I want to be an, or actually I want to be an orchestra composer, but when I grow up, but I, uh, you know, I, it's, it's, a, there, there's something about that level of, of musicianship, you know, when you, what, you know, John Schofield, like him playing a solo, him navigating chord changes, but it's, it's spontaneous composition is the highest form of art. As far as I'm concerned, these guys are Pat Metheny. I mean, I don't love everything he does, you know, and his sound sometimes is, or Stern, like, it's, it's like, can you back the fucking chorus and reverb off a little bit please and get it a little more dry in my west you can hear some distortion well, they probably feel the same way if they hear help but can you can you can you can you wet it up a little bit <laughs> exactly exactly right. exactly and see so i want to hear it like i want to like what you hear west and jim hall and they don't have it all bathed in you know mm -hmm. in that sound but but fucking a can those guys improvise yeah. holy yeah. shit man i'm just, just like Matheny is is like i've seen him so many times and and uh, see Schofield, I saw Schofield with Miles, man. And I saw Stern with Miles. And I'm just like, God damn, man. Like, it, they're just as phenomenal. So I can get past the little sonic issues I have and, uh, and appreciate someone that is spontaneously composing, you know. And, and I know they are, you know, I know they are. Whereas <laughs> if I'm going to hear, you know, somebody you know a rocker like play the same kind of licks they've been playing for 30 years i might be less inspired i might feel a little sure. less inspired you know what i mean so sure i mean and that, and that does settle in with jazz players too there's a there's a very sort of uh formulaic like if you're coming at it from rock like i you know as a kid yeah listening to rock music and you, at first you're like impressed by any any jazz you hear because it's it's it sounds more expanded than, yeah, than yeah. what you're than what you're accustomed to but then you start to sort of get where those patterns can 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 be very um, by the numbers as well when you we see enough jazz bands oh, live. no 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 que no question yeah no question about it yeah i mean that's i mean that's why i i'm a proponent of uh of learning the vocabulary you know and that starts with with you know like uh you know scales arpeggios intervals chord voicing so you have your garden for you know garden variety harmonized you know scales and then you then you have chord melody and it's it, it, but once you know the, the know the words the vocabulary then you you know you hopefully can be constantly doing so you're going to start i might start a solo off, off playing the same charlie parker riff i played on a minor seven flat five chord for a million years with the with the raised nine you know the major nine i should say but you'll wander uh, into something fresh exactly, from there, exactly. From there. you hope it's it's a springboard and then you're you know as, as john john abercrombie said that you're improvising you're using your ears and following your thing hey um, i have to uh yes I, I, uh, <laughs> We, I can, we can talk all fucking day, I'm pretty sure, uh, about music. But if, you, if there's anything that we didn't hit on, can you just... There, okay, um, you have to go write this, because I was just going to ask you about your lyrical... Like, like uh, you know what, I'll just, I, I can email you, and I'll, I'll just give you a preview of what I was going to say. Um, uh, you know, over the years, your, your lyrical style has gotten less elliptical, and it sounds... My first impression of the new record was, was that you're moving back towards... Um, a somewhat more indirect uh, lyrical approach where you're taking more liberties with words and, and a little bit, bit more poetic license. And I was just curious to get your. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's funny. I said to my manager um, and to, to people I've talked to about this. Um, I, because I hadn't done an album for six or seven years, um, but I'm, I, I still, as always have, you know, write notes. I'm constantly, I have like these notes taped to my desk. I have no note, little notebooks in my, you know, car pens everywhere. And I'm always just observing, you know, and, 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 I, uh, and I love 
I love language. And I think the, I was never a, the guy that's going to stand on a soapbox. Uh, and there's a, 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 Bob Dylan calls them finger pointing songs, I guess. I, I never wanted to write the finger pointing songs. So I always saw a little bit of myself in the song where there was a specific character that I started with, but then it became about the language. And so when I'm writing, I'm, I'm, I surround myself with, you know, I, I'm, some of the same poets I've been reading since I was, you know, a, a, a eight, 17 or 18, Sylvia Plath, uh, uh, you know, did William Butler, Butler, Butler Yates, Blake, um, then I got people like Sandberg and E.E. E. Cummings. And, um, you know, I love Tom Wolf. I, I stole lines from him on this album. I've, I've read probably 15 or more Twain books and, uh, and Graham Greene, all these people. So I, I, I just look at words for inspiration, you know, and I might get a line from somebody or a concept, but this, this songs just kind of really, I felt this time pressure because we, I, I, we agreed to do a new album, I think in January, maybe. And then I was finishing up the orchestra piece for the, the kids in Memphis. Uh, and I delivered it February 6th and started helmet like the same day I had started sketches, but the, they, I, I wasn't trying to be trying to make any kind of point about anything. They, these words were kind of just pouring out like gun fluff, you know, uh, I've always, I've always, some of the same, you know, I guess my ex father-in-law called said, I uh, said, um, all I do is write fuck you songs. And he said, they're really good. Fuck you songs, but they're still just fuck you songs. And I'm like, well, yeah, you know, everybody should be good at something. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's, I, I don't, I, I don't know where the language comes from. I, I was, I think early on, I was so determined, you know, I was more self-conscious and I was determined to be like the anti-songwriter. Right. There was I, a detachment I, or something, or there was like, I, I hated, I hated that pretentious, like, Oh, sing a songwriter. I'm a singer songwriter. Oh yeah. And, and so here we got more guys with C, G and D and I'm like, come on, man. Really? Like, that's like, I don't know. I, I wanted to have my own voice, you know, and I, and I felt like it's your, I feel like it's your obligation as a musician, as a writer to, to create your own, your own thing, man. And it, whether people love it or not, I'm not, doing this so everybody in the planet loves me I'm, I'm not I'm doing it because I have to and I love it I love doing it and and so that goes for lyrics and it goes for uh the mute the music so I'll, I've written songs with CG and D for little films here and there and I know the chords and I love love those songs you know I mean I love Tom Petty I love you know all that music but it's sure. that's not that's not me I'm not going to redo that you know sure sure I, not going to redo acdc when i said to some guy at the bar when i'm still bartending you know he said who's your favorite band i said acdc and he came to see us play at cbc he's like you guys got, don't sound anything like acdc <laughs> no shit you know wow okay it's like dude like i just you don't go, go try to be your heroes you know what i mean you 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 hold them above yourself and you, you study them and you you know and so lyric lyrically i don't know it just I mean, we've had a hell of a fucking six or seven years since 2015. I mean, what the fuck is happening to this country? And I've, I've always, from, from, I think I was born with this, like, we're, isn't, isn't it supposed to be we're all created equal? We, cause we are all of flesh and blood and bones and skin and we breathe and we die. And so why is someone better than someone else? because of their religion or their skin color or their, their sexual orientation or, you know, they're not. And, and I, and I, you know, I have a trans godson, the crap he puts up with in Oklahoma and, and, and I'm, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pissed off old guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I also believe you show love and you, you can present things in a way that, that it's not, you're not standing on a soapbox. Right. And you, maybe you make people, maybe you rattle their cage a little bit and make them think about something in a different way. And I think this stuff was just kind of coming out and, uh, you know, whatever. Thank God. Again, it's the notion of reading and studying and practicing and working and, and trying to expand your horizons as a person. And then when you sit down to write, forgetting about everything. Right. You know? It just seems like, it just seems like, like a new song like Holiday is sort of halfway from the directness of some of the, you know, your, the, uh, some of the more recent stuff to halfway back to like biscuits for smut, where it's not entirely 
there's some yeah, yeah. there's some freedom with imagery there where it's not necessarily that's a not great like, that's a that's a great very astute comparison actually because biscuits for smut was a was a, a story my grandfather told me about a dog they had named smut and my grandma momo who was part of uh, very much part uh you know uh native american she would bake the biscuits too hot and they were uh, too hard and so she threw them out the window for smut and i turned it into a song about a serial killer right. and in holiday i'm singing you know about my sister and i every time we get together for christmas or i get together with friends you know my friends back east we end up watching fucking non-stop law and order or uh date law you know uh uh, uh you know uh true crime yeah crime yeah crime, you know date date line forensic files it, murder 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 you know how they say and and, and you and so i start thinking about you know that's these are human beings you know that that we're talking about and and i never um i love that tarantino movie and i'm i'm not a massive fan of uh the one that the, the pulp fiction uh, but i love reservoir dogs and i really loved uh that last one because i fucking hate the manson family i fucking hate that p- people would glorify these pieces of shit and buy songs somebody that said that, that caused so much suffering you know and and and, and uh, to innocent people you know and so that's kind of that that notion and that's like, right really uh, I, I cannot stand it when people uh use actual murder scenes on album covers zorn has done that um and then yeah. that's not to single him out like you know i actually am a fan yeah. of, but 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 like I, you know lots of bands have done that it's like it's not a fucking it's not yeah. fucking wallpaper you know what i mean it's yeah just, there's like, nothing there's nothing funny or cool about it at all at all somebody suffered and his family's still suffering when they let what's her name out or they're about to let her out or whatever it's like the la bianca's don't to fucking she knifed them she held them down and fuck you go away just just i did yeah i so that idea and the the obviously the language which really you know it there i back in the betty meantime was my first exposure to any kind of major music business stuff and i published it don't use don't use profanity because then we can't you know whatever and so i always had that kind of back in my mind to go but but fuck is the perfect word and i go and a lot of meathead meathead rock bands that's and, and you know i said to the label and to everybody and i said i said look man bridge gums he said fuck you i won't do you tell me sound, uh, sound garden you know i want to fuck 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 you uh and there was another example i used it was the other one that he's a uh, oh i want to fuck you like an animal and i go it's just a word you know what i mean it's it there's i i want to i want to the the, I, the the idea is this sort of celebrity lowest common denominator uh, 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 language, you know, uh, show about cars or cooking or, you know, murder or whatever the fuck it is, or like reality. I don't, I've never seen the housewives in New Jersey, but I've seen the commercials and I'm just like, this is like, we are, we're, there's something just vile about our culture that, that I, and I, and I don't have a tell, I don't, I have a TV, but I have it. I have I stream Yankee games. I don't have a cable or anything. So I can't watch any of these programs. So I'm always fascinated when I'm at, you know, my godson in their family's house or my sister or my brothers and, and, I, and TV comes on and I do get a lot of material from it, you know, um, but and commercials are amazing and, and stuff, you know, uh, and, you know amazing. Um, and it, it's, it's, there's some kind of the numbness uh, and the, the obliviousness of, of our, of our culture to me is, is, is something I've always kind of, uh, tapped into you know i mean a song like driving nowhere you know or um um uh what's the first song on um uh pure no uh, yeah dead to the world uh uh, uh, uh life oh. or, life life or death you know i, right, was, I right. started started that at my parents house you know mom and dad with fox news on and dad in his lounge chair and you know, uh, you know, what do you think about that marijuana? It's like, they should, I think they should just kill those guys. You know, I'm like, really, Dad? Like, you know, I smoked pot from the age I was 13 to what? You know, God, are you fucking kidding me? Kill them? Like, stop. Were, weren't you high when you were in that field looking up at the stars? Weren't you? Because weren't you smoking lots of pot at that I was, age? I was smoking a lot of pot back then, but I was, I, I would drink. Um, I drank and I, I did smoke, but the pot back then in 1979 or 78 was when I started college. 
uh, 7980. It was nothing <laughs> like the turbocharged stuff that is basically yeah. like, like LSD in herbal form. Now. I take like, one, if I take one hit now, I'm like, whoa. So I'm like, my girlfriend, she likes weed and she's always, you know, trying, wants me to try, to try this. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. And uh, my bandmates, like once, once or twice a year I do, but, but uh, man, back then, I mean, it was with $10 for, you know, that's, that's not four fingers, you know, like four <laughs> finger bag. I mean, right, you just right. like 10, 10 joints, you know, whatever, and listen to Frampton comes alive, you know, it was a very, very different experience, but I was, I was high a lot, you know, and, and uh, we played hacky sack. It was the beginning of Frisbee golf and hacky sack at University of Oregon. It was freaking hilarious. I'm going to try but, to squeeze in, I'm going to try to squeeze in two super quick questions. One, because, uh, and, um, the you you talked about being like a, a hippie from Oregon, songs like Shirley MacLaine and I love I heart my guru. Yeah, is there yeah. something is there something we're missing or that I'm that is not so obvious? Um, I'm I mean, making to, fun. I mean, I'm making fun uh, of it. I dated a girl who was uh, close friends with Shirley MacLaine, and and um and uh, she's you know uh, like I I said it's it's I just find like any any spirituality any philosophy that you cram down someone's throat um or uh or it makes you feel superior makes someone feel superior to anyone else I, I it's kind of i do i mean i do poke fun at it i am a hippie from oregon i mean i grew up in you know, I went to college in Eugene and, you know, had long hair and a beard and Birkenstocks. And, you know, when there was only one, one, one style of Birkenstocks, you know, and like, and I, you know, tried vegetarian many, many times and then was for 10 years with my ex-wife, but I guess that's a hippie, but uh, I think more of the hippie in the, in the sense that, that I believe in peace and love. And I believe in, I, I, I got that, had that instilled in me in, in, in Eugene, Oregon, that, that, people were pretty accepting and there were no, uh, there, there was no reason for such divisiveness. And, and, uh, but it is, I do find it funny. I saw a license plate in um, Malibu. He said, I, it was, I, I heart my guru and that's right. And, and I, I, this is maybe should be off the record, but I was, uh, I was at a party in LA years ago and doing cocaine with a bunch of people. And this girl said to me, she's like, do you meditate? And I was like, you know, she's like, I can teach you how. And I'm like, would, would, you, would we do lines of cocaine first? And there was a giant Buddha, like uh, carved Buddha above us. And, and, and I'm like, this is the most hypocritical pile of shit. I'm like, you're going to teach me how to meditate. We're doing cocaine, which is the most disgusting drug. I haven't done it for a million years and I never will again. Well, it's the most it disgusting, like talk about yourself drug ever you know and uh and we're talking about we're doing it in front of a buddha that's that's decoration you know it's not as this, this is so far from buddhism it's decoration you know right, and, right. And it's there's like, a tendency to for america for for our consumers like specifically american style consumerism to reduce everything to kitsch 100 percent. that's what it's, rob that's, it of, that's what i'm singing about yeah so, but, but, and, and, and yes, but is, but is there, is there other, are there other aspects of like, uh, I don't know what, I guess what you call spirituality or new ageism that you do appreciate? Is there any of that, that, that speaks to you at all? Or, oh man, or I like, still, I, yeah, I still, I still do, do my half ass you know, I haven't been to temple since the uh, uh, pandemic hit and my, uh, the, I don't know if you're Eric Erlinson at all, but he's uh he's a, he's a saint he's the he used to be partners with courtney love and hole he's the mm -hmm. he's the good person in that tandem he's not with courtney anymore obviously she's a mess but uh he he kind of helped guide me and uh i reached out to him at the at, at the at the advi at advice from another friend who's a buddhist and uh i call myself a bad buddhist i think my ex-wife kind of turned me on to it a little bit but um you know so there's there's i absolutely believe in a higher power and i don't believe in you know uh that i mean uh, like all the sort of hip, the hypocrisy of christianity and and you're you know would <laughs> these people are talking about jesus and yet they're the most divisive you sure. know 
it was like pretty sure that wasn't Jesus people. And, you know, Jesus apparently, you know, met Buddha and learned, you know, or, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, um, it's suspected that he went to India and got a lot of that from it's there's no question. I mean, I have, I've had experiences in my life, but I see Buddha, I see God, I see whatever you want to call it in, in, in animals. I mean, you communicate with animals in a way that you, you that, you know, because we don't speak, speak a common language and there's a connection. I mean, I pull up to people with their dogs hanging out at their car, at a stoplight, and that dog looks at me and, and knows that I'm a dog person, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? I'm like, hey, buddy, what's up, buddy? And they're like, yeah, meet you too. Right. So and those then, songs, so those songs, those songs are not about those are more criticisms of this of the superficial absolutely yeah abs- presentation abs- of those kinds of things abs- absolutely and i don't know much about shirley mclean but the crystal worshiping thing and you know when i got really sick a dear friend of mine gave me some of those and and, and because they came from a dear friend and who i love and adore and admire i put them up and she's like these are just she's she, she, you could toss these but i use them and i put them i go yeah they came from you that's so that to me is there's a real connection. I have I have rocks that my mother had. You know what I mean? They were with little notes of like this is you know it's like they, it's because they're from my mom. You know and and that so I feel there's something there. You know what I mean? I also feel like rocks are there's something about rocks that are like this is this they've been here like long before I was and long after I leave these things are so there's just some kind of spiritual depth to them that is really incredible to me and i still stop you know when i when i see flowers or plants and i take a lot of pictures we were walking my girlfriend is dog sitting and we were walking the dogs and these plant i don't know what the flowers were uh, but i still uh i take a lot of pictures of plants and flowers up close because of the texture the the depth of them and like i remember walking in austin and these trees that i'd never seen anywhere in california or oregon or new york and they they have these hanging flowers and i was like wow so i i got to get pictures of them and i still but i also feel that way about, about buildings architecture when you're in europe and the ta- the tactile feeling the stone like this has been here that mozart walked down the street mozart sat in this goddamn stool and drank a beer so i sat in that stool and drank a beer you know at that pub uh you kocek or whatever it's called down from the opera house and of course you know i love that connection to to that's a spiritual thing to me, you know, and, and, in you know, that's why I went to Bartok's house and to his grave and to Mozart's grave, and, you know, and to Beethoven's three of Beethoven's houses, you know. And so, went- and so your, your respect for, for your musical elders, which we've been talking about this whole time from the very beginning, I wonder how much that has to do with the limits you imposed on Helmut's sound because, and yeah. I just wanted to say, okay. And, and I just wanted to say, the there are there are parts in your body of work where you're opened up more like on that joe henry record i cannot tell i, I would never have guessed that was Paige hamilton and i and i think that's i like that about that that it's like oh yeah. there's more but but i wonder how much you set those parameters because as you say you're you don't identify as a jazz musician you feel like that would be kind of um infringing it sounds like to me yeah, yeah. Something that's so, oh, totally so, so I, I just, uh, that's, that's my last question. Um, but uh, I wonder how much of Helmut's identity comes from that. But I also wonder, because it seems like you keep coming back to, and you have expanded what Helmut can do at various points. Now it's like there's several different sides to the band. You can hear that on the new record. There's this like sort of bigger sort of glossier style on like size matters there's some of the more underground stuff like uh the the born annoying compilation and even the the set, split seven inch you did with the melvins or whatever that oh, was yeah, a few yeah. years back um that kind of thing now there's like sort of multiple facets to it but uh, but but it seems like it came from what i'm getting from you is it came from a place of respect for this other style of music that you didn't want to like cop too much from or to or take too much from but yeah. also it seems like there's something that there's an attraction that keeps you coming back to that and that's that i'll leave you on that to just yeah. expound on that and i'll let you go <laughs> cool. Cool. cool yeah inter- interesting there's no question i mean i you know as, as we talked about earlier like 
I feel humbled by music and I feel, and, and the reason I chose it or it chose me or whatever is I knew I would never master everything. I knew I would, I would now, I would still, and there's a, there's a, I believe it's uh, not Morley Safer. Uh, who was the other guy? Uh, Ed uh, Bradley. Uh, not Ed Bradley, Morley Safer. Uh, yeah, not rather, uh, maybe it was Morley Safer. No, it wasn't Morley Safer. Uh, uh, there was one more guy. Uh, that his interview with Miles Davis when, in Malibu from a million years ago. Miles, ta- I'll never forget that. Miles saying, you know, like, yeah, I just, I wake up and I just, I want to c- find that one more note, that one, one new, whatever. I can't remember specifically, but I got the, I, you know, his, his sentiment, like that one more chord voicing substitution, one more. And in like that, every single day I wake up thinking, thinking about that. You know, today I was back with Barry Harris and I'm like, um, I'm, I, I have a dozen or more tunes that I have played th- through various keys for my voice. I'm a baritone and I'm going to do an album where I'm, I'm doing my John Stoll, Jim Hall, Bill Evans approach to jazz guitar, my watered down version, me, you know, the dumbass jazzer. Um, j- done as jazz wannabe and my voice singing these songs that I, I, I grew up hearing my parents playing on stereo that I love from Ella Fitzgerald and or George Shearing and you know they loved Ella Fitzgerald and George Shearing and they loved Nat and um, you know and Dixieland and stuff and so these songs there's something in them that and, and so to, to me it's this kind of um, I have this huge, this reverence, you know, I'm, I'm not Nat King Cole. I'm not, you know, not even Diana Krall. She's amazing. You know, I'm, uh, I'm, I like, I worship Billy and Sarah and Ella, um, you know, and I love, but I also love Tony Bennett and, and Frank and Dino, you know, Dino, cause they kind of, they, they did their treatments of those songs. So there is, I don't know. I mean, I'm rambling slightly, but there, but I think, saying it about um like helmet is like i'm really good at helmet and that's the only thing i'm really good at and everything else i study and i work at and i practice and i play and when i wrote my piece for the memphis kids the uh conductor who's grew up a helmet fan he said god this sounds like you and i go well that's encouraging that's good and because i want to sound like me in every in every music that i compose that I write if I'm doing it I have a couple of jazz tunes and they are they are me you know and when I do this album this jazz album it's going to be mostly standards but I'll do a song or two when I did the Coltrane piece on the new album it's me trying to pay homage to one of my all-time if not my single all-time biggest hero ever and but I know I'm not I'm not trying to recreate what he did when he wrote a love supreme and or, that album, or the Beatles or, or the Beatles or Blue Oyster Cult when you've done those exa- songs exa- either. Exa- exactly. Exactly. And I, and I, and I still hold all those musicians in the highest esteem. I love Buck. I, I mean, I, and Eric Bloom. I mean, I, and when uh, Howie Weinberg who mastered meantime and Betty told me that he played, uh, Betty for for bucks and songs from Betty when he was because he was working on a BOC record because he said you know asked me who I loved and and I and I was like uh and he said he dug it I was like whoa you know I'm 16 at watching Blue Oyster Cult took me back there white jumpsuit you know blazers like all this stuff you know just disappointed that they didn't play Hot Rails to Hell as their encore they played Don't Fear the Reaper because I was at Dork you know they're gonna play Hot Rails to Hell what what you know, and, you know, but, um, yeah, it's, I, I think, um, I, I don't know. I think that, I think if music, if music doesn't keep you humble and hungry and, and, and enthused about life, then, you know, and I think that's the beauty of it. It takes us out of our physical kind of daily existence, you know, and that's what it's, what it was meant for. And I, I feel that when I listen to John Coltrane and he was, he wasn't, just walk, you know, he's probably walking on water, but he wasn't, he wasn't just the guy that loved, you know, sweet potato pie and, you know, did heroin early on. And he was, you know, or that was a family man. He was, he woke up and he, you know, he dreamt a love Supreme. He composed, he wrote it all out that next day. Um, Mozart, you know, Mozart was on another level musically. He was writing this stuff first, first draft, right off the, you know, right off, 
it comes coming straight out of him. I mean, that is fascinating to me. And I got, I got tears in my eyes the first time I went to Mozart's house and stood and looked out the window that he looked out and he was five, six and I'm six, three. And, but I stood looking out that up at that, that road, this man stood right here. You know, right. They were, these are people who are on a quest that is so consuming and so, um, uh, driving that they are like religious or spiritual seekers. I mean, Coltrane was overtly a spiritual seeker, oh, but, absolutely. But, he, but he wouldn't have had to be for, for his music to convey that same level of intensity. Like exactly. I, I, he had to be, he, he, I, I feel like there was this urgency and this crying and this wailing in his sound. I don't know how to describe it, but I always um, loved reading an article about how you weren't going to sit in the room listening to the John Coltrane, Coltrane Quartet and having a, co a cocktail conversation. Right, you were going to right. fucking listen because they were powerful. And I feel that about, you know, uh, uh, about, you know, playing music. When I, every, every time I pick up the guitar, I play it as if it's the last time I'm ever going to do anything, you know, and I, I, uh, I, I, I really get, and Helmet was my vehicle. Helmet was, it allowed me to, to, to shut my mind off and go into this. And it still does. I still, mm -hmm. that's why I love playing this music so much. And I, when I got to play with Bowie, it was amazing. It was a lot of work. I had to learn 30 songs in two weeks and they'll play all this music from like a, at that point, 99, like 30, well, over 30 years of his, you know, his, his time and, and, um, you know, as a, as a uh, writer and singer. And, um, but I was missing that kind of that, leaving my body experience that I have with helmet. I, 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 I need that. And I, and, and for me, all the music that I connect with does that, does that for me. You know, well, you, you, I read an interview years, like 30 years ago at this point, where you said that you, when you first heard back in the saddle, you had a, a, a sensation of floating, leaving your body and floating above yeah. the music. And, uh, and that it, it, it sounded even better to you from your adult years, but but I know the experience you're describing. Yeah, because uh, I and I'm I'm crazy about that song. And I'm crazy about uh, classic period Aerosmith, and I think they're one of the greatest things ever. Um, but uh, that ex that exact sensation you're describing, there's a Black Sabbath tune called "A National Acrobat," and every time I hear it, I feel like I'm 12 years old. That's that's Kyle, Kyle and I. Kyle and I, that's our favorite. Kyle uh, Stevenson is my mu musical brother. He and wrote this the album when he we. That's our favorite uh, song. I was I put on um, Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath. Uh, God, when fuck where where were we? Somewhere South either South America or Australia somewhere, and and uh, we, we had that this moment. Yeah, that's absolutely. I yeah, it's one of those pieces of music that I always get that sensation from. I'm always a little superstitious, like, uh oh, is this going to be the time where I don't feel that, and I just. I can feel like I'm 12 years old with my auto reverse yellow Walkman just, just, just transported. So I know what you're talking about. And then what you're saying with the John Coltrane, you know, we're talking about Blue Oyster Cult, those records that, that aura of mystery is so powerful on that, on that early BOC stuff. It's like, it's like, it's like these people are like aliens or something like they're, there's like, Incredible. where are they coming from? Incredible. Yeah. Secret treaties might be the best rock rock guitar sound ever ever recorded. I mean, I it's just fucking magic, man. I just yeah, I love I love that love that that band. Yeah, yeah, no, that's I I'll never you know I I keep going back to the same things as well. You know, I mean, I don't know. I, I my cousins who are older than me turn me on to the Beatles, Rubber Soul, and that um, I mean I. I every couple of years I go back and I'm like, I, you know, my girlfriend and I, we were listening to help the other day. And I'm just like, God, I still hear new things. I still get excited. Right. You know, uh, uh, like it's just, it's, I think, I think it, I think music making music um, deserves and requires that level of, of, of commitment, unconsciousness when you're doing it. Like I say, we learn, we study, we practice, we improve, but you sit down and you do it. And all that matters is this song, this, this riff, this lyric, what you're doing right now. And for people that, that do it and with an agenda, in my opinion, and it's about, I need to, I need to, uh, 
you know, impress people or I need to show how cool I am or whatever, then it's, it, it's not going to hold up. I've talked to so many young bands. I'm like, don't try to be Nine Inch Nails. We already have Nine Inch Nails. Be mm -hmm. you, you know, and they make that album trying to be Nine Inch Nails and they're gone the next year, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, and I think that's, um, you know, I don't know, be your, be yourself. And that's what learning this, learning music allows you to do. It allows you to, 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 to express yourself, you know, your, your, uh, come up with your own form of musical expression, not, not regurgitate what someone else has done, but I really, I better. It's yes, after, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> thank you so, so much. It was great talking to you. Feel free to get my email from, from, um, uh, uh, Perry. From it's, Perry, it's, Perry. And yeah, I'll yeah, send yeah. you some but, links to stuff I've written. Yeah. My pleasure. Yes, Thanks for good. going extra. Real cool. Hey, my, ple my pleasure. Have a great day. I'll yeah. That's not Bowie behind you, right? On the snare, on the snare. Uh, yes. Skin yes it, it was done for me, given to me by, uh, on the rock cruise by the singer from a, a band. I want to say they're called 10 years. I, I'm not familiar with him, but the kid was really cool. He came up to me and said, I did this for you. And so, yeah, it's a, yeah. So I had a helmet skateboard that was, you know, we did. So <laughs> yeah. Okay, man. Okay. See you. See you. Have a great day. My pleasure. You too. See you. Bye. 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 -bye. Bye, -bye.